My guest today is journalist Louis Molina. Louis started his career as a sound man with NBC News in 1980, covering the Civil War in El Salvador. Since, he has produced, filmed, and recorded sound in many hot zones around the world. He's earned the Alfred DuPont Columbia University Award for Excellence in Broadcast Journalism and worked alongside some of the most influential journalists in the world, like Barbara Walters, Peter Jennings, and Dan Rather, just to name a few. Welcome to the show, Louis. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, man, did I want to speak with you? Uh, I've heard incredible stories about, you know, uh, your career and experience and things you've seen, heard when you were covering for the National Press Corps. Um, tell me a little bit about, uh, first of all, tell me about, about your background a little bit. Um, when did you start? How did you get into the whole journalistic line of work? Uh, my background from the very beginning was accounting. Um, when I was very young, growing up in El Salvador, my father wanted me to get an education, and I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. So I figured accounting would be safe, you know, mm -hmm. I can get work. And I did accounting for a while. I was successful doing accounting, but I was missing something. I, I couldn't bring myself to do that the rest of my life. So mm -hmm. I wanted to do something mm -hmm. interesting. And then, uh, because my family was in the television production business, uh, news and television commercials in El Salvador. I had the opportunity in 1972 to cover a major international mm -hmm. story, which was the uh, earthquake that destroyed Managua. And after that, I was hooked. I just wanted to do filmmaking. All right, all right. so let's talk a little bit about that. So you were living, so first of all, you're from El Salvador, yes, right? Yes. You're born and raised in El Salvador? Born and raised in San Salvador, El Salvador. San Salvador, yes. And so that in itself is somewhat of an interesting country to be covering news in, right? Because it has a very interesting history, and yes. even to this day, there is a lot going on in El Salvador. Right. But So you were living in El Salvador, and then... Um, there was an earthquake in, in Managua, like you said, which is a, which is a city in Nicaragua, in Nicaragua, correct? Yeah. So how did, you, how, how did you even like, get that opportunity to go over there and cover the earthquake? Uh, my brother-in-law, brother who was the producer of his news show, him and my sister were the producers of the news shows they had in San Salvador. And he was given the opportunity by the president of El Salvador to travel to Managua just a couple hours, a few hours after the earthquake in the presidential plane. Mm -hmm. And he asked me early in the morning, would you like to go with me and my cameraman? And I was like, yes, I want to go. <laughs> you know, this is a great opportunity. I have learned how to use the, the uh, movie cameras and from the technicians that work for my family. So uh, that was a great opportunity. Mm -hmm. I was given a fair warning that it was going to be hard because the, the uh, destruction was total. We had to be self-sufficient for at least three or four days with food, water, everything. And, and so we went in the presidential plane. Uh, that was my very first first exposure to international news. So when, when you went and you were going to cover an earthquake zone, <clears throat> no one prepares you for what you're about to experience and see. Um, you weren't experienced yet at that time, right? This is the first time you're going to a disaster zone. Right. Um, what, what was it like when you got there and you saw all the destruction and everything that, that came with that earthquake? I'm, and let's just put it in perspective. That was a devastating earthquake that happened. At that, it, it killed about 10,000 people, right? right? And um, so you went out there and you can hear and read and talk about it, you know, but once you see it, it's completely different. Yes, it was. Uh, I wasn't prepared to see what I saw. I knew it was going to be bad, but wasn't prepared mm -hmm. to see the human suffering, the drama of people trying to rescue their very relatives with bare hands, bleed. I mean, it was overwhelming for me mm -hmm. and my, my colleagues, you know, my brother-in-law and the other cameramen. We just felt, I mean, drained physically and mentally. And most of the times, you know, it was that sense of not being able to help anybody mm -hmm. because we were just there filming, but you wish you could have helped these people. They have no help, none whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Everything had been destroyed in the earthquake. They didn't have any police, any firemen, no ambulances. Everything was gone. 
the Nicaraguan people were on their very own. Mm -hmm. So it, it was horrible for me. It was like living in hell. Right. And when you, when you arrived, and you were on the Pre El, Sal El, Sal El Salvadoran presidential plane, right. was the president with you at the time yes, on the plane? Yes, the Salvadorian president was in the plane with us. So um, they were very close friends with my family, you know, because in El Salvador, once you, especially if you, you're part of the television establishment, you know all the top figures. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, yes, we were with the president, and after we filmed the president of El Salvador exiting his plane and being greeted by the Nicaraguans, we were on our own. We, we just, you know, could do whatever we wanted to do, which was limited because there was no transportation. Uh, at the airport, massive, massive aid coming from all over the world. I saw planes with markings from all over, Mexican Air Force, German Air Force, French Air Force. It was really amazing to see that. Uh, but there was no transportation. We couldn't go from the airport to Managua, which is a few miles away. So somehow my brother-in-law managed to find an old beat up uh, pickup truck that will take us there. But it was limited what the man can do because he said he had lost everything. And the fuel he had in his truck, he needed to get food for his family. So it's so limited had, what he was able to do for us. So you, you, you actually found a local who was willing to take you from the airport to, to the city where the destruction was. And he did it even though he probably had to go and look for his family members. And where are you going to get fuel from at that time, right? So why, was it, why did he even offer to, to transport you guys over there? I don't know. You know, at the end, after he took us to as far as we could go in Managua, because it was all destroyed. You couldn't go any further after a while. You know, the, mm -hmm. the, the roads were blocked. Uh, we offered the man money, and he didn't accept any money. He said, since you're a journalist, I want you to see the tragedy we're living through. Maybe we can get help. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of register, you know, we really have to do something. We, we have cameras here. We have movie cameras. But again, you know, I spent two full days in Managua. We, we all did. And I wasn't prepared. Yeah. I, I was so, so impressed by the amount of destruction and seeing human beings in that situation. It was just horrible. Yeah. And you guys are traveling. Obviously, you have rations with you. Right? You have water with you, you have food with you, you know you, you're there for two to three days or whatever it is and you have enough with you, but the rest of the population doesn't have access to it. So when you were eating or drinking, you were, were you hiding from, were you trying to not show them? Yes, we had a protocol uh, that if we wanted to drink some water, we had to hide behind the, the debris and all the destruction not to show the people that we had some drinking water with us because it was limited, it was just for us. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was no way we could eat, you know, because mm -hmm. the smell was overwhelming too. What do you mean the smell? Uh, the, uh, I guess there were thousands of people under the rubble and it was beginning to smell bad. It was ever present, the smell of decompos decomposing bodies was ever present day and night. Mm -hmm. You have it with you, you have it in your, in your body, your clothes, mm -hmm. you know. It, it's, it's really incredible to be in that situation. I was reading you took 2,000 feet of film with you. That's a lot of film. I mean, for our listeners, international listeners, that's over half a kilometer in, in film. How do you transport this stuff? Well, we have these big backpacks with us, and we have to have enough film because in a situation like this, the last thing you want to do is to run out of film mm -hmm. when you're in the middle of the story. Mm -hmm. So we have to carry all this film, plus the batteries to power one of the cameras, uh, mm -hmm. and e enough food for us and a change of clothes for a couple of days, you know. And I bet when, when you're out there and you're, you're seeing all the suffering, you and you're carrying all this heavy, it doesn't seem so heavy anymore. No, it goes away. I mean, at the beginning, it's, it's very burdensome to be carrying all this. Mm -hmm. and, but after you see what these people are going through, you just completely forget about your discomfort. You're just so impressed by what you're seeing. Mm -hmm. And you're filming everything you can. We were filming everything with the two cameras. One camera had audio. So we were able to interview people that were crying, screaming, you know, looking for their relatives, trying to find anything they could salvage. 
And uh, it went two days of that. There were some good positive aspects of it. When we run into a, a field hospital that the U.S. Army has set up in one of the poor neighborhoods, and I saw the uh, soldiers preparing, you know, uh, kitchen uh, situations and uh, medics from the, the U.S. Army treating Nicaraguans. That was the beginning of the aid being organized, but in the, it, it wasn't much really going on for the Nicaraguan people. Right, right. Um, and then, so you were there for two days. And what, what do you think was the most significant takeaway for you for the first time covering such a dramatic event? The biggest takeaway was, especially after we finished the documentary and we showed it for a, a show that was specially organized in San Salvador by the president for fundraising, how powerful images can be in influencing human beings to either help or support a cause. So I was sold on the documentary making. You know, I always wanted to study filmmaking. At the time, I was just an accountant. Mm -hmm. But I, I saw how powerful filmmaking can be when you do a good documentary. Okay, I was sold on that. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I also realized that to be able to work in documentary making, I have to be a member of a, of a news organization because news goes hand in hand with documentary making. So th you knew that this is for you afterwards. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I was so impressed by it. Yeah. And, and so when you came back um, and you were laying in your bed and in, in, in safety, how was it? How do you process the, you know, the suffering that you that you witnessed? It was still with me. It's hard to process that. You can't just walk away from it. You can't just erase it, especially the contrast that after I'm back, you know, everything's nice. I have a nice warm bed. My wife is there with me. I have food. It's my family home in San Salvador. But the images of the people starving and no water, no mm -hmm. food, uh, they were very vivid in my mind. I couldn't get rid of that. Yeah. You know, I couldn't even sleep the first night I went back to El Salvador. I was dead tired, but I, my mind was still going a thousand miles, you know, thinking, trying to process everything we saw and everything we had filmed, okay? So it was, you know, I still can go back and, and relive those moments right, many, right. many years ago. And and uh, Nicaragua is a, is a neighbor country to El Salvador, yes, correct? Yes. So it's in Central America. Yes. So it was also close to home for you at the time. Right. So that helps. I, I think, you know, a lot of times, you know, when we're living in the U.S. and we hear about news of something happening far away, it's more difficult for us to relate than if there was something to happen in another state, for example, right? Yeah. So for you being in El Salvador, did you feel like, hey, I have to go and actually help these people, they're my neighbors? Uh, yes, and the, we realized that the only way we could help them was by doing a good job with the documentary to show it in El Salvador to see, you know, the suffering and to instill in people in El Salvador the need to help. Mm -hmm. Since we couldn't give any physical help and we were there, like I said, we were devastated. Mm -hmm. And we run into other crews, Germans and Mexicans, mm -hmm. and they felt the same way. Because you're there, you, you, you're filming all this, but you can't lend a helping hand to mm -hmm. anybody. It's mm -hmm. limited what you can do for these people. So being able to put it in the air and seeing the results, that was, uh, again, very mm -hmm. uh, a great impression for me. And I felt good about it being part of that. Yeah. Um, I was reading about, you know, your, your story a little bit. And one thing that, you know, was to me was unbelievable was the prison, prison, uh, story that you, you talk about, right? Uh, you guys were, went to a prison that com completely collapsed. There was about 2000 prisoners in right. there. They all, they all perished under the rubbles. And, uh, t tell me a little bit about that ex experience. That must've been terrific. Ter oh, that terrific. was yeah. probably in the two days, probably was one of the worst experiences of the overall situation mm -hmm. is this prison. It was the size of two city blocks. It was a huge prison for males. And the smell was, oh my God, it was mm -hmm. overpowering. We had to take a break a couple of times filming because we just couldn't take it anymore until we ran into a Mexican crew that gave us some cheap perfumes and they shared this with us saying, look, use this, put the cheap 
perfume in a handkerchief, mm -hmm. and it's going to kind of mask the smell of decomposing mm -hmm. bodies. And we tried that enough to go back the second time to get more footage. At this point, the relatives of the people that had perished under the rubble, women and children were there screaming at the top of their lungs, trying with their bare hands to move these huge boulders and concrete uh, columns. There was no way no these way. people. And the soldiers trying to, with the axes and mm -hmm. picks and, and shovels, mm -hmm. they needed heavy equipment to even start moving this. And there were no survivors yeah. there. It's just desperation. It was sheer desperation on these people. And more people kept arriving and, and more soldiers trying to push them away so they wouldn't get sick. It was horrible. It was, we were witnessing hell on earth. Mm -hmm. I just couldn't believe what we were seeing. Yeah. You know, it was impressive. And, and of course, we were filming a lot of this. But still, after a while, it's like I had a heavy weight on my heart. Mm -hmm. You know, it was so impressive what we were seeing. Do you still have that film? You know, after my family sold the business, I think it went with the business. It's a mm -hmm. shame because I would have loved to have a copy of that documentary that lasted half an hour. Mm -hmm. uh, when we came back to El Salvador, the president, who was a good friend of my family, by the way, he requested that we do a half an hour documentary along with the Teleton that they were going to organize. And they organized it so the whole country will watch it. They link all the television stations by order of the president. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, it was a fu major fundraising effort, and it went so well. Because first they showed the film, so once you see the film, you, I mean, you have a heavy heart, mm -hmm. okay? You want to help, you want to do anything. And then they had the Teleton, where all the main actors and comedians and singers, you know, took place. And the donations were incredible. The richest families in El Salvador, because it was all being televised nationwide. They all were donating thousands, thousands of dollars, competing with each other. Who donated more money? Yeah, and great. the poor people too. You know, ten dollars, five dollars. He was absolutely wow. magnificent. So, I mean, your work had this in incredible impact on on people's lives because it helped raise a lot of money, right? So it was a great success, and you were completely hooked, right? I was completely hooked. Yes, and you're like, this is. This is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. Yeah. And this earthquake happened in 1972, right. correct? And then in 1980 is when you went on your next assignment. So it was eight years in between. Right. Uh, so that was almost like a one-off for you, but you kind of knew you're coming back to right. it, right? Right. And then in 1980, you um, you you got a gig with NBC in your home country. No, actually, I went back to Nicaragua before mm -hmm. I got a gig with NBC because when I graduated from film school, I had to do a thesis film. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had been following the politics in Nicaragua, where Somoza was the, the uh, dictator. And then the Sandinista Revolution came about. That's when I was in film school. By the time I was graduating, they had won the uh, revolution and expelled Somoza. And so I decided to do my thesis film based on the triumph of the revolution in Nicaragua. So I went back on my own dime, you know, as a student. Mm -hmm. And my family gave me a few hundred feet of film, lent me a camera. Uh, so I flew to Managua. Uh, my cameraman provided, uh, my, my family provided a cameraman to help me out. And I filmed this documentary. Mm -hmm. And I, I showed it in Los Angeles as the thesis for my film. Yeah. But, and I, when I went back to cover the triumph of the Sandinista revolution, I can still see Managua hasn't been rebuilt. So when did this revolution happen? In, uh, 70, in the 70s, while well, I was still going to, working in accounting and going to film school, they were still fighting. They were fighting with some Muslims. Right, right. And, and this is the same city that the, this earthquake happened. It yes. killed 10,000 people. Yes, you the know? same city. Yes, the same country. So was there... Um, was there still devastation and destruction uh, even years after? Oh I mean, my the God. rebuilding time must have taken forever. Well, part of the problem was that the geologist told Somoza he couldn't rebuild there because it was a very heavy earthquake zone. Mm -hmm. The subsoil was too weak. Right. So they couldn't rebuild where Managua was. So they left all the old buildings in there. They didn't bulldoze them and everything. It was awful looking. 
It was a horrible. It was like a war. It looked like a war zone war years zone. after. Right. And then, of course, the revolution really didn't help. Now you've moved to Los Angeles at this time? Uh, I moved back to Miami because I wanted to go to film school. Mm -hmm. But at the time, they didn't have any film schools or full program film schools here in Florida. Now they have them all over the universities, but at the right. time they didn't. So my choices were either New York or Los Angeles, the biggest production centers. Of, and I found this nonprofit uh, film and film, radio, and television school in the middle of LA mm -hmm. that had been founded like 30 years earlier by some of the pioneers in, 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 in filmmaking because they wanted to train technicians mm -hmm. and filmmakers. And it was a non-profit, so the tuition wasn't as high as FSU, you know, any of the other universities. So I went to this school. It was great. I loved mm -hmm. every minute of it. When did you graduate? I graduated in 19, the end of 79, mm -hmm. 1980-ish. Okay. And did you go back to El Salvador or did you stay? Um, I went back to El Salvador to bring some television equipment for my family business. Okay. And I used to do that every now and then. They needed equipment. I would buy cameras, you know, recorders, whatever. Mm -hmm. So I have gone back <clears throat> to bring this equipment to my family. At this point... The situation in El Salvador was getting really, really bad. This is the beginning of the Civil War, you know, a lot of violence, people disappearing. And so my family business was really booming because news business, you know. And then the, net, the major network started coming to El Salvador and setting up bureaus down there. And my family business was the natural client for them because they had all this footage and they had crews that went out. And in one of those deals, I met one of the NBC producers. I was showing him the equipment I had just bought in the state and brought to my family. And the guy was like, wow, you speak good English. Uh, did you go to school in the States? And I said, yeah, I just graduated from film school. Mm -hmm. So he goes, wow, would you like to work for NBC? <laughs> we need a salmon. <laughs> right now we can use a salmon as a free freelance, you know, as a contractor. And I said, yeah, I'll give it a shot. And after that, uh, I found that doing sound for uh, news was a lot easier than the sound I had learned with the Nagra reel-to-reel -reel in filmmaking school. It was a lot easier. Mm -hmm. So I started doing sound for NBC. And my colleagues understood from the get-go that I knew the story inside that now, which I did. I was born and raised down there. <laughs> Yeah. I knew all the main government officials. I knew all the main military guys. I knew the commanders of the guerrilla, because a lot of them did business with my family. So I knew them, wow. OK? Mm -hmm. and, and so I started putting my two cents into the story, suggesting, you know, we should do this. We should interview this guy. And pretty soon, they started trusting me, because <laughs> I was. They saw, OK, you have the end, very valuable right. Right, to the news organizations to get access to to this and and so this is in El Salvador, the civil war that happens. There, I think it went from 1980 to like 1992. It was like 12 like years, 11, 12, 12 years, years. Right? and it was a brutal war. It was uh, human rights violations left and right. Uh, I think 75,000 people or so killed, um, and you in the middle of all of this, uh, covering the story. Yes, I was in the middle. We used to go. Every two weeks, I used to be scheduled to go to El Salvador for two weeks, and then they would rotate the crews. And uh, it was perfect for me, because I loved what I was doing. Yeah. You know, gave me the sense of uh, power when we f uh, send the satellite transmission to New York. Mm -hmm. And that night, at the time, 18 million Americans will be watching nightly news. Must feel good, huh? I felt great that I was part of that team bringing all this to the people here. Right. And remember, the U.S. was deeply involved because we were providing hundreds of millions of dollars to the Salvadorians. They were an ally um, in, in the context of the Cold War, right. I believe. And this is under the Reagan administration. Under the Reagan administration, he was afraid the communism was going to go through Central America into Mexico and become an existential threat to the United States. Mm -hmm. He was... The Cold War, typical Cold War confrontation between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. The guerrillas were supported by Cuban and Nicaraguan. They were giving uh, weapons, training, uh, logistical support, and the U.S. was behind the government. 
Now, that's the sad part is, you know, the country was a military dictatorship, mm-hmm. okay, because it was all military men that won the presidency. The, uh, the elections were sham elections. Mm-hmm. So that's how the war started. People got tired of, of the social injustice, lack mm-hmm. of health care. It was horrible. I mean, you want to talk about, you know, separation of classes and, and income inequality. But the division of classes was outstanding in there. You know, when the, the war started, I was so surprised to learn through the Jesuits that run the Catholic University, they were the social, social scientists that knew all the percentages, when less than 10% of the population in El Salvador had uh, a good diet. Mm-hmm. I felt guilty that I was one of those 10 percenters, you know. Right, right. You were privileged. Oh, my time. God. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, you got to be kidding me. 90 percent don't have an adequate diet. Right. No right. wonder they have, we had a war in this country. But I knew it from the beginning. Mm-hmm. I was actually very critical of that, you know, with my peers and my parents. But, hey, it's like don't rock the boat. <laughs> kind of. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know. And that's the other thing, too. Like, you have to be now you're entering also a territory that can become risky for you, depending on because you're a part of a journalistic team that brings messages to the world, that broadcasts it, right? And plus you have some in with the government officials in El Salvador as well. So I'm sure you, you kind of were, were mindful of the things you were saying uh, in public. Yes, I have to be very careful, including sometimes we will go to interview one of the well-to-do families, people that I knew, you know, I knew who they were. Uh, some of them didn't know me personally, but I knew exactly who they were. Mm-hmm. And the whole conversation will be in English because these people were educated in the U.S., Europe. You know, they spoke impeccable English. So I never let these people know that I was a Salvadorian because I knew there was going to end up being a controversy, you know, about the war and what do you think about the war. Mm-hmm. And I don't think they were ready to hear my opinion about the war. Did they care? Well, they wouldn't be very upset with me <laughs> to, to hear what I have to say about yeah. the social injustices. See, they just didn't see it that way. They just saw it as communism trying to take over their hard-earned money. But it was more complicated than that. It always is more complicated yes, yes. than it seems on the surface. Right? And that's yeah. the thing, you know, um, helping the producers and correspondents I will tell them, we got to listen to what the soldiers and the guerrillas mm-hmm. tell us. They, were, they belong to the same class, but they, they were fighting each, each other. other. Right. And you so, know. So what, what were you? Were you doing sound? I was doing sound, but pretty quickly they said, you know what? We don't need a producer. If you can do sound and produce, which was fine with me. Okay. And... Uh, then I also, because I was trained as a cameraman in film school, I did everything in film school. I will work with the cameraman in a situation that, you know, he's inside the viewfinder, mm-hmm. the black and white viewfinder, so he can't have peripheral vision, but I did. So if I will see something, I will just whisper in the ear of the cameraman, pan left or pan right, you know, there's something called, and he will follow up. So I was another set of eyes. And I knew how to ask the questions. I was bilingual. I also considered myself bicultural. Mm-hmm. After being in the United States for a number of years, having an education, mm-hmm. I, I more or less understood how Americans saw the world. Mm-hmm. So I was able to relate to that and also relate to the poor peasants in El Salvador. Tell me the most incredible, dangerous, emotional situation that you encountered while covering the El Salvadoran Civil War? There was one situation that one of the things is in New York, our bosses in New York always wanted us to, if possible, do stories related to the Huey helicopters. The what? The helicopters, the Hueys. They call it the Hueys. The helicopters that they use in Vietnam, Mm -hmm. they were using some of those at the beginning of the war. They were limited because the Salvadorian only had six or eight of them. And that was a hindrance for them because at the beginning of the war, the guerrillas were really kicking their butts. Mm -hmm. They were winning the war. Mm -hmm. They They had the initiative. The army was badly trained and badly equipped. And they were really, they were at the point of almost losing the country. That's when the, the U.S. got alarmed and the hundreds of millions of dollars. Mm-hmm. And they got a lot of helicopters. And uh, 
But somehow the uh, top people in New York for the networks always wanted us to do stories related to the Huey, I guess, because it's such an iconic, iconic image of Vietnam. They wanted to right. bring that up. Right. So they still, you know, because it was a typical case of a counterinsurgency against the established army, the Salvadorian army. So they wanted to see that. Anyways, one day uh, we arrived at this place, you know, close to the, where the war zone was, the eastern, northeastern part of El Salvador was where the worst fighting was going on. Mm -hmm. So we arrived at this place where they had this helicopter parked in there, okay? And I'm like, oh my God, here's a helicopter. Let's start filming there this. There it is, yeah. And yeah. I see the helicopter doing, you know, sorties, taking off and going around and coming back, with soldiers and supplies. So I started kind of pushing my way around. Can you please, can you give us a ride, you know, with American journalists? Mm -hmm. And they say, no, 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 no. You wanted to ride on the helicopter. Yeah, mm -hmm. we wanted to get a ride on the helicopter mm -hmm. to be able to film because I'm thinking this is perfect. Right. If we can do a story about it. New York's going to love New this. New York is going to absolutely yeah. love it. Mm -hmm. Be in good shape with this. Mm -hmm. And they kept saying, no, no. The, the pilot, I will never forget the pilot. The pilot was out of a John Wayne movie <laughs> with the beret, the, 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 the ray band, the pistol on the side, and speaking impeccable English. He had been trained at Fort Bragg. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I spoke to him in English. He loved that. And uh, I gave him cigarettes. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, I had a Polaroid camera. I used to take pictures of him trying to PR this guy. And I kept begging him, come on, man, you know, we got to do a story. You know, when you were in the U.S., and finally, he said, well, look, I'm doing two kinds of missions. I'm doing resupply and medovac. Mm -hmm. He said, I cannot trick you on a medovac mm -hmm. because you might end up being dead. Resupply, yes, it's, it's simple, you know, it's safer. So I said, well, can you take us on a resupply? Mm -hmm. He goes, well, maybe later on. So we kept at the distance, you know, filming him and hand gestures from the distance to the pilot. Hey, are you taking it? After a while, he, with the glove, gave me the thumbs up and waved, come on in, come on. And he's about to take off in the helicopter. So we're excited. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. This is happening. Right. We're getting this our is, shot. We're getting our mm -hmm. shot. We're getting the money shot here. Mm -hmm. So we jump in the helicopter. And my cameraman is next to the pilot. I'm next to the cameraman. And the sides of the Hughie are open. The two sides are open. Yes. Okay? And you have the gunners. You have the M60 gunners on each on side. On each side. Mm -hmm. and, and so as we're taking off, the pilot is, the, you know, the roar of the props is really mm -hmm. overwhelming. But the pilot is screaming something at the cameraman. Mm -hmm. And the cameraman went like this. And I said to the cameraman, what is the pilot saying? He said, screaming at me. He said, he just said, you're flying at your own risk. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. <laughs> now you're telling me this? <laughs> what does that mean, you know? <laughs> what that meant is that he wasn't going on a resupply. He was, he was going on a medovac. Then I realized, because after like 10 minutes flying, he went down, he put the helicopter down in a violent maneuver mm -hmm. and started flying treetop level. You know, flying the really fast. This mm -hmm. is combat flying. I knew that. I didn't, nobody had to tell me this. I, my heart was pounding. Okay, and we're we're filming all this. One of the, all of a sudden, he brings the helicopter to a clear, like the top of this mountain, and sh boom, puts the helicopter down. All very fast. Right. And I can hear the pilot screaming in Spanish, "Fire! Fire! Fire!" Fuego, fuego to the gunners, and the gunners are going at it. And I can see guerrillas on both sides. They, they were firing, firing back. back. Yeah, that's why they're firing. We're like, oh my God. And then before I can even react to this, somebody started bringing all these soldiers inside, just throwing them inside, all shot up, blood everywhere. Oh my God. We were like, we were in the war zone. They definitely were in the middle of it. And you can hear the fuselage. You know, the Getting bullet, hit. Yeah. bullet be being hit. And I'm thinking, oh, my are you, God. Are you rolling on this? We were rolling. We never stopped rolling. We never stopped rolling, okay? And, uh, you know, maybe it was 20 seconds, 30 seconds. To me, it was like hours. But they kept bringing all these soldiers, and we got all splattered with blood. And then the pilot took off, and he kept saying, fire, fire. 
and the gunners never stopped. They were full blast on both sides. And we took off, and the pilots started doing this from left to side, right. maneuvering with the helicopter for two reasons, to avoid taking ground fire right. and to give the gunners full aim, you know, full view of the sh They were firing and everything, and we could hear in it. And I'm thinking, one of these kills the pilot. We're all dead. Right. But he gained at it altitude and then put again the, the, the helicopter on the, you know, combat flying on top of the... Right. Wow. We were so... I, I can begin to tell you <laughs> how impressive that was. Yeah. We came back to the place where we had taken the helicopter and the adrenaline is flowing so much, we jump out because we need to get the shot of the helicopter, of the, pl uh, the soldiers being taken out by ambulances. Right, right. So we got the whole sequence, right? How many soldiers did you, did you, did they rescue? There were about four or five soldiers. And they were all wounded? They were all, one with was fa like facing me, he was really in bad shape. Half his arm has been blown off. Oh. And they had this kind of a smile on their face because they had been shot with morphine. Mm -hmm. So they were in no pain. They, had, they were high on morphine, but to see these men all, you know, hurting really bad and with the kind of a smile, it was, it was horrible, okay. So we landed, we got the shot, and then our producer came running because we were all covered in blood. Right. The producer saw this and he comes running, oh my God, are you, you guys are hurt? Yeah. Are you wounded? We're not answering him, we're into this, we're filming. After that we finished filming, the cameraman who was a really six foot two guy, very bulky, big guy. American? American. Mm -hmm. He lost that man. He grabbed the producer from the shoulders, started shaking him. We almost got killed, you mother f. We almost got killed. Do you realize what we just seen? But of course, the producer didn't see it. Right. It's just the two of us that right. saw that. But right. he was, you know, he kept going, and I kept going. Mark, Mark, calm down, right. calm down. You know, we were so high on adrenaline. We yeah. couldn't come down. We couldn't come down to earth, okay? We were shaking all the way back to the hotel. You know, we went to the bar. We had a couple good drinks. We just couldn't get it out of our minds. Oh, yeah. I'll tell you how dramatic that footage was. That Tom Brocco in New York uh, introduced a piece saying the war in El Salvador is increasing in violence. And here is what an NBC crew ran into it. You didn't mean that reaction. They let it go the way it was filmed. No edits. No edit. It was all in there. It was like an action movie, but oh it was real. God. And you were, you were right in the middle of we it. You were right in the middle of it. So that's mm -hmm. one thing that I had nightmares for nights. The, the face of that soldier with them smirk and all his side blown to pieces, all bloody. <laughs> Look, I used to come home and have nightmares, okay? Sometimes at night, my wife would go, calm down, you're not in the war anymore, calm down, you're home. Oh, but Louis, you know, that, that's post-traumatic That's stress. only the beginning, yeah, yeah. yeah. I just I mean, you're seeing some of the same things that, you know, soldiers see yes. when they go and deploy right. into war zones, it, except for your weapon is, you don't have one, you have a I camera. I didn't have a weapon. You know, you're shooting with a camera. Right. And then another thing that I remember very clearly, uh, when the pilot is swinging the helicopter from left to left to le left to right, mm -hmm. you know, gaining altitude, I'm afraid the cameraman is going to slide out. Fall out. Because he has his hands on the big cam We used to right. have these Ikagami cameras that sure. were like 35 pounds. Right. So I'm grabbing the seat of one of the pilots, uh, seat at the mm -hmm. bottom of the pilot seat because we're laying on the floor of the helicopter right. and with my other hand I'm grabbing the belt of my cameraman because he's swinging around I'm afraid he's gonna fall, fall off out. Yeah. you know and at the same time holding the, the video cassette recorder that in those days was a big monster about 30 pounds that I have hanging on me <laughs> it, it was I'm telling you it was horrible wow. Wow. okay and of course Broco personally thank us and boy you guys are okay you know yeah, but it took me a while. I will never forget that. You so, know. Uh, did you go back and co continue covering the El Salvador and the yes, Civil War afterwards? Yes, yes. We, well, we continued. We were there. You know, we yeah. had at least about another week to go Got after it. that. Right. How much time did you spend 
covering the conflict. Oh my God, I used to go there for years. In those, mm -hmm. I used to spend about seven months out of the year traveling, not all at once, but a week here, two weeks there, a week home, another two weeks there, mm -hmm. you know, and there was a lot of going on in, in Central America. There was a civil war in El Salvador, the Contra War trying to dislodge the Sandinistas, the, mm -hmm. the Reagan was financing the Contras, and there was a very deadly, but very quiet civil war in Guatemala too. Wow. So I used to spend in all those three countries Every now and then there will be peace negotiations in Costa Rica, and for us, oh my God, what a relief right. being in Costa Rica. Costa Rica didn't have an army. Right. Such a beautiful country, you know, yeah. peaceful. Yeah. So you would be covering the peace negotiations in Costa yes, Rica. Yes, covering them. And everything. we knew that was going to be a, a little bit more of a uh, easier task than being in. Yeah, the every time there were some peace uh, talks, mm -hmm. they, they, they held them in San so Jose. The peace talks were being held uh, in reference to. What, Nicaragua, uh, Guatemala? Mostly the Nicaraguan War, mm -hmm. yeah. The, con yeah. the Contra. The Contra War, right, yes. Right. And you covered that one as well? I covered that Did one as well. Did you meet any of the Contra rebels? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I spent, uh, one time I spent a week and a half with the rebels hiding <laughs> from the Sandinista army. That's the first time I ever had monkey for <laughs> for dinner. <laughs> you ate monkey for dinner with, yeah, with, because the, with the Contras? With the Contras, yeah. Because we were running low on food and we were really hungry. They said, look, the only thing we can get for you guys here is monkey. <laughs> so they, they shot the monkey and we ate it. They cooked it. I ate it. It was tough. <laughs> but let me tell you, when you're hungry, anything sounds good, okay? So wait, so you're in the, in, in the, in the jungle? In yeah. The, in the forest? With yeah. With the contrast? With the contrast, yeah. And spending days there, uh, yeah, interviewing them, following them, following them. Following them, yeah, being embedded with them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, I saw them planting mines, you know, to s try to stop the Sandinista forces. And then, of course, I covered the other side, going with the Sandinista army. Oh, you did? Yeah, I covered both sides of the of the contrast. Yeah. And then I covered, the contrast had a lot of... Uh, training bases in Honduras mm -hmm. that at the beginning was supposed to be a big secret. Mm. They were financed by our government, okay? But I used to work with some of the best reporters at NBC. They were investigative reporters. So mm -hmm. <laughs> we discovered this base that we weren't supposed to see in Honduras, mm -hmm. and it was a big uproar because Congress had a hearing about it. Now you see how important the media is? Oh, yeah. It's powerful. We, Powerful. Yeah. We were exposing the things that triggers a congressional investigation How about yeah, that. Yeah. I mean, talking about the Contra, uh, the Iran Contra affair, which put Reagan under an right. investigation, right? Yes. Right? What happens and is the U.S. was selling weapons to Iran, so and you, the money, the money that Iran right. paid, they were right. financing the weapons to the Contras Congress. because Congress stopped the supply of money to for weapons. Mm -hmm. So Reagan went through the side door yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. with Colonel Oliver North, That's who was right. the architect. That's right. Okay? Yeah, yeah. Wow, I mean, that's intense. That's some intense stuff. Yeah. And, and so... Uh, Central America is, is a hotbed at the time, and you're covering all of it. Everything. You know? I used to spend a lot of time there. Mm -hmm. At one point, they offered me a staff job as a soundman-producer mm -hmm. and to be able to open the first bureaus for NBC in Central America. And they said, look, uh, you have the choice on where you want to live, which in my case would have been San Jose, Costa Rica, because it was right. peaceful, beautiful. And beautiful, yeah. But uh, they were going to give me a staff position. Okay, uh, but I talked to a lot of uh, older employees of NBC, people that were mentoring me, and asked them if it was a good idea to take a position, since I was very successful as a freelance. And uh, some of them said, you know what, better don't do it, because once you sign in with the networks, it's like signing in with the U.S. Army. They can mm -hmm. send you anywhere mm -hmm. in the world. Signing away your life. Right. Like and I, I, at the time, my son was two years old, and I didn't mm -hmm. want to be uprooting him and my wife. Well, that's the thing. If you have a family, if you don't have a family, it's you, fine. You, you're adventurous. You're a young guy. Right. You know, you just want to go and see that, that, that stuff. You know? But, but I, once there's other people involved. Involved, you know, you know yeah. and I didn't want to put him through that. So, mm -hmm. uh, and people said, look, you're very successful. You know right. Latin American inside and out. You're bilingual. You're bicultural. You're going to have a lot of work. You don't have to do this. 
you know, plus eventually I ended up owning my own gear, mm -hmm. which you rent to NBC, so it makes it more profitable there for you. you. Yeah. And yeah. you control what you have, the right. kind of gear. I used to buy the best. I had the best gear. Right. Because that made me very competitive. For sure. Yeah. Okay. I mean, even today, it's still the case, right? Right. Even yeah. today. Yeah. yeah. But uh, that's how it started, you know. Uh, and I didn't take the position with NBC. And you know what? I look back and I'm glad I didn't. Right. Because after NBC, with whom I spent about 10, 11 years exclusively working for them, although I was freelance. Mm -hmm. uh, then after that, they downsized the Miami Bureau. But then ABC, I run into one of my ABC competitors. Mm -hmm. And he's like, hey, Louis, what happened? Are you going to get a buyout from NBC? And I go... No, no buyout. I wasn't an employee. And they're like, oh, I thought you were staffed with NBC. You were going all over the world for them. And I'm like, no, I'm freelance. And so they go, come to ABC. So they recruited we, you. Yeah. Right, right. And I started working with NBC again another mm -hmm. few years, covering, again, all the stuff in Latin America. Yeah. It, it, among those things was the Colombian drug war that you were also. The Colombian drug war. Uh, so what was your involvement with, with that conflict? I started going to Colombia and filming the government forces. And two or three times we went on a, on a mission to eradicate the poppy fields. Mm -hmm. You know, you fly in the middle of nowhere for sometimes an hour and a half mm -hmm. in a fleet of Hueys. You know, you're with the colonel, the commanding officer, and then there are three or four Hueys mm -hmm. full of soldiers and, and uh, Hueys with machine guns. Mm -hmm. And we will arrive and the... the Colonel will say, well, we cannot go landing because they have to soften the landing area, meaning they will machine gun and strafe everything because there were people mm -hmm. down there hiding, waiting to protect their crops. Are they, were they a part of the uh, rebel forces, the FARC? They were part of the rebel forces. Or they probably paid by them to paid protect, by the, protect paid the Paid by fields. the rebel forces. They mm -hmm. weren't regular uh, guerrillas, but right. they were paid by the sure. to protect the, the, the crops. Right. And so the army had to come here and kind of either scare them away or kill them. So we will be flying with the colonel until the radio came, okay, it's safe to land. Mm -hmm. You know, and we will land. And I saw the eradication of the poppy fields and mm -hmm. the labs that you find in the middle of the jungle. <laughs> like out of the movies? Oh, my God. The, lab, the labs where they process cocaine, you know, they have all these chemicals. Uh, it's amazing. And so the soldiers will put... Uh, explosives and blow it up. Destroy it. Yeah, destroy it. And they were destroying so many of them. I mean, the, the labs were all over. They were everywhere. But you can't see them from the air. You gotta go down into the jungle, the, the, the uh, Amazon jungle. So these were sophisticated labs set up in the middle of nowhere. Yes, they were all sophisticated. Yes. Co cocaine. Right, right, yeah. It Was it close to the poppy f uh, sea fields? No, or? sometimes no. Mm -hmm. They had to transport it by mule, by mm -hmm. whatever. You know, a lot of peasants were making money working in that. Right. It was like a major enterprise going on, and they were trying to dismantle that. Do you ever find yourself in danger covering that conflict? Yes. Uh, oh, yeah, of course. And, and sometimes... In being in, in, in Bogota, it will be, mm -hmm. you know, you got to be careful because the drug dealers were all over the place. One time, one specific time, we, uh, we have to film the, the mansions of all the main couples, the main drug dealers, because we knew where they were all living. So right. we went one day specifically getting exterior shots of all the, this huge mansion, this yeah. I mean, you can imagine the This is in Bogota now. This is yes, the capital around of Colombia. Around Bogota, right. Bogota, around there. Mm -hmm. So we had filmed maybe three or four people, and then that night we wanted to go to dinner to a really good restaurant with all the upper classes going to Bogota, you know, because our fixer, fixer is the person that worked for the network in the country. She was well connected with all the upper classes, so right. she said, oh, I got to take you to this great restaurant. Mm -hmm. Anyways, we came to the restaurant, we settled down for dinner, and... We're just having some wine when out of nowhere, this is the same day that we had photographed all those mansions, okay? Right. It's us, the crew, and Brian Ross, one of the famous investigative reporters mm -hmm. at the time for, with NBC. Mm -hmm. Anyways, out of nowhere, here comes this couple guys and came straight to our table, started taking pictures of all of us. This happened fast, okay? Before we can even react, they're gone. And... A reporter, Brian, said, that's it. we got to get out of here. Right. We've been made up. 
Right. We got to get out of here. Let's go. Let's go. We couldn't even. We went straight to the hotel. We were really scared at this. You were marked. We were marked. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They knew exactly. Now they have that picture. So we went straight to the hotel. In the meantime, we're mobilizing NBC to send us a Learjet eye as soon as possible to evacuate us. <laughs> we were in deep danger at this point. And they're saying, well, from Miami, we're going to take, no, send it from Panama, send it from Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. You know, with all the resources, they say, okay, first of all, go to the hotel and immediately move. Go back to, go to another hotel. Right, right. So, which we did. Change your location. Right. Mm -hmm. And then uh, two, three hours later, uh, remember, all this is going on, the coordination, and NBC is scrambling to get us out of there. Right. After two, three hours, they said, okay, you're going to have a Learjet at the airport. So, we went straight to the airport and Learjet back to Miami. But it was situation. We were all very concerned. We have been made up. Man, being a journalist in, in these high-risk areas, you know, in these danger zones, it's, it's no joke. Journalists get, ki- get killed all the time. Oh, yeah. And I'm sure you were of that fact yes. at the time, you know? Yes. And did you ever think I could be one of them? Would you be reading news articles and you read about this journalist or that journalist being kidnapped or being killed and... You're like in the middle of an assignment and you're like, okay, this is kind of real. Right. That happens to me all the time because I had, during the war in El Salvador, I lost, uh, let's see, three, four of my colleagues that were shot in, 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 in confrontations between the army and the guerrillas. These are were friends that I used to have a beer at the hotel, yeah. you know, bodies of mine. And let me tell you, when that happens, Yes, you start thinking, am I going to be next? Right. You know, and uh, I mean, you're very careful because I wasn't uh, one of those risk seekers. You probably think, wait a minute, what is this guy doing in there? You but weren't I, one of the risk takers? Didn't you just tell me that story about being in that helicopter I going know. up and down and being shot at? Yeah, that was, but I wasn't one of those gun ho, oh, let's go there. No, mm-hmm. no, I, I took the risk, but it was well calculated, at least for mm-hmm. me. More and there were many situations where my, my friends were more gung-ho. And I would put mm-hmm. my foot down and say, wait a minute, mm-hmm. you know, no. let's not do this. Kind right. Let's start thinking good and hard, okay? Yeah. And they'll be, Louis, you can be excused. No, 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 it's not just about me. They kill you people. Right. I'll be in deep trouble because I won't be able to forgive me. Right. Okay, so there were situations where, you know, you want to push the envelope. But a Salvadorian warning, that helicopter ride, though, we almost got killed. Yeah. Let me tell you something. And then... In that case, we saw the video after. We were shaking. Oh, I'm sure. Couldn't believe it. we yeah. didn't stop the camera. <laughs> we went on and on. What happened to that footage? You still have it? Ah, uh, NBC probably still has okay. it because yeah, they saved all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Man, uh, you you probably love to see some of that footage oh, today. Oh huh? yes, and uh, and then you know after a while uh, covering the war in El Salvador, uh, my colleagues really had tremendous trust in me. Not only my judgment, but the knowledge. Mm-hmm. Uh, of the situation and the fact that I could switch to Spanish, even the the, yeah. the, the Spanish that the peasants speak, you know, yeah. that is yeah. very the dialect or dialect. the slang or whatever. They I was use. able to, to get into the dialect or, or speak to a, mm. a colonel in a mm-hmm. Castilian way. You know, I could right. do either one, and English the same thing. So I I brought that with me. Mm. You know, I was always being nice to the soldiers. You know, sometimes the checkpoint they wouldn't let us through, and mm-hmm. I would be giving them uh, uh, cold drinks, Coca-Cola, right. water, cigarette, got my Polaroid camera out, started taking pictures. Here, look how good you look, you know? I mean, it's part of the gig, it's you know? It's to, it's to get in with those kind of guys, right? Uh, and whatever means necessary. And there's no rule book. You don't know what you're going to have to do to get the story, you know? You just have to go with the flow, right? The only thing you're not supposed to do for ethical reasons is to pay money. Right. But you can do a favor to somebody. Hey, you want to smoke? We used to carry right. cigarettes. No, no, I smoke, but right. they did. Yeah. So, you know, once you get people on the right side of you, they'll be willing to go the extra mile to give you more. I learned that very early on. I practiced that when I was producing in Cuba. Because mm-hmm. being a Latino in Cuba, guess what? I will get more elements mm-hmm. that the Anglo producers didn't get. Right. Because I was from El Salvador. Right. And, you know. There's a level, another level of trust, familiarity. Right. You c- they can relate a little bit more to you. Right. So what were you covering in Cuba? Everything that you can think of. Yeah. Cuba used to spend 
I used to go to Cuba four or five times a year. Mm -hmm. You know, started with, uh, well, when Gorbachev went to tell Fidel that he wa wasn't go going to give them any more money because mm -hmm. the Soviet Union was pulling out. Mm -hmm. I went as a producer for Tom Brokaw. Mm -hmm. You know, and I took Broco to all the main places. I got him interviews. I was assigned to Tom Broco. At this point, I was really good with the NBC. Yeah, and you, you, uh, you, you were with Fidel a few times. Yeah, Fidel. Fidel I met him uh, the first time was with Maria Shriver. Maria got an exclusive interview. You have to understand, Fidel doesn't give interviews just to anybody. Right. He's very calculated. He was very calculated whom he gave interviews. So Maria, because of her relationship with the Kennedys, and she's very Kennedy, by the way. She's a classy lady, okay? Yeah. Great person to work with. Mm -hmm. Smart, considerate, you know, mm -hmm. polite. Mm -hmm. So Fidel gave her an exclusive interview, and at this point I had built a good reputation, solid reputation, not only in Latin America, but in Cuba. Because, like I said, I was able to get elements for a story that other people wouldn't get. Right. Okay, so... I was a natural thing when Marie's putting together a, a crew. My boss said, "No, you got to take Louis Molina because he's our right. Cuban expert." Right. Okay. So uh, a group of us, about five people, flew ahead one week ahead to prep everything. You just don't show up with Fidel, and okay, here we are. Of course. Yeah. Every scene is pre-calculated and pre-planned. So in that situation, they said, "Okay, so you're gonna put a microphone on, on the president?" I said, "Yes." He said, the guy said, the head of security, the, the head, chief of Fidel security, you can imagine how high up that is. Right. He said, nobody, but nobody touches the president. If you want the president to be Mike, you're gonna have to tell me the equipment you need and we'll provide it. I said, fine. So I wrote it down, the you know wireless microphone, right? I said, here's what we need, okay? And they said, fine, when the time comes, and then the logistics of work, you know, transportation and all that. So, you know, it's fun. I was thinking about this. There is no one that gets closer to another person than the sound person. Yeah, because you have to put the mic on them. You have to literally touch the person right. to get the job done. Yes. And if you have someone like a Fidel Castro who... God knows how many people wanted to see dead at the time. Right. There is a lot of paranoia, probably. Yes, oh, they're, they're incredible paranoia about people that get close to Fidel. So yeah. I understood that. Right. And, and so the day came, you know, uh, we arrived early to the, to the meeting point with Fidel. And by the way, Fidel was always on time. He would be there on time, mm -hmm. okay? So Fidel shows up, and here we are with Maria, you know, producer, two, three crews, Okay, and I was coordinating the uh, the sound of all the crews because I have to I have wireless. They have program all the wireless, so right. all the all the crews can get the same Deep. from Maria, mm -hmm. the microphone, and Fidel. And I was coordinating that, make sure that I was one of the crews, but I was like the mm -hmm. chief engineer. Sure. So I'm thinking I always work under the premise of the what if with the equipment, right? Because besides being into the story, I, I became an excellent technician, mm -hmm. cameraman or audio. I can you know fix all kinds of things, make my own cable. So I used to have the what if rule. What if something doesn't work? What do I do? Right. I always have plan B. Cover your butt. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking. Okay, so they're going to provide the microphone. The only thing they're going to give me is the receiver. Mm -hmm. They're going to put the transmitter on him and the mic. Right. I told him, uh, level the air, the whole thing. What if they don't have it? Mm. So I had one with me. Mm. I had the, the, the wireless, you know, ready. So Fidel comes and sh shakes hand with Maria, and we're already filming. You don't stop filming when Fidel shows up. And then I noticed, so he said, well, okay, are you guys ready? And Maria said, yes, he has no mic. Mm. So I go and whisper in Maria's ear. I said, Maria, the president is a mic. And she said, oh, Mr. President, you need to have a mic so we can hear mm -hmm. you. And Fidel said, but of course, he said, I don't see any problem. He said, do you have a mic that you can put on me? And Maria said, yes. And he opens the, the uh, army fatigue he always wore. Right. And underneath he had a shirt. He said, here, you can put it in here. Maria said, Louis, you can put the mic. Right. Oh, my God, Mike. I had all these 
all these bodyguards right. watching every minute, okay? Because that wasn't supposed to happen. Right, right. But what are they going to say? No, no. They weren't going to embarrass him. You were about to go and touch Fidel Castro. I was about to touch Fidel Castro, okay? And put it right here, the transmitter. The whole, you know, you put your hands. Yeah. Okay, I yeah. was, oh my God, I was very nervous. I'm sure. <laughs> okay, and after I did that, I said, Mr. President, can you say something to you here, mm -hmm. my check? Just check. Mm -hmm. Well, after that normalized, the head of security came to me and he said, whose mic is that? Mm -hmm. Whose mic is that? Is that your mic? Did anybody, I, I took my, I said, look, you guys blew it, okay, because right. you were supposed to provide that. What do you want me to do, right. say no? Right. I said, it's my mic. And after five hours, I want you to go and replace the, the nine volt battery in the transmitter right. so we don't lose anything. Right. And he goes, what, what, you know, he, they were really flustered. Okay, they were, oh my God, they were beyond themselves. Because they were beyond, they was be, it was beyond their control at this point. Exactly, yeah. but I solved the situation yeah. and we continue, you know, mm -hmm. and again, after four or five hours, I called the guy mm -hmm. and I said, my battery or yours? <laughs> right. Just put a nine volt in there, right, right. okay? Well, I don't know how to, I said, I'll do it if you come with me. And, and so he came, but they were, the whole day was, they were nervous. Okay? How, was, how was Fidel? Like, what is he like? Let me tell you something. Oh, what was he like? The man was a charmer, okay? Mm -hmm. He was like talking to a walking encyclopedia. He can give you uh, economic figures, uh, history, dates. He's like a walking encyclopedia. You can talk to him or ask him anything. Right. And he will spend a half an hour giving you like a, like a professor. Like a university professor that you ask it. Right. And he was a charmer. He looks at you straight in the eye and makes you feel like you're the only one talking right. to him. He has this very, put you on a spell, okay? Whether you like him or dislike him, because I didn't like him and I di didn't dislike him. You know what I mean? I, was, I knew he yeah. was a dictator and I didn't yeah. quite agree with everything, but yeah. I did admire him for something that he had done in Cuba, but I wasn't one of those sold out. Right leftist you know right but he is a charmer yeah. okay uh i mean he has to have been you know with i mean he was an incredible again like you said you hate him or love him you know but he was an incredible leader he was able, able to define the united states and every president yeah. and got away with it cuba little cuba little tiny mm -hmm. poor cuba right. 90 miles away yeah. from us yeah <laughs> exactly so uh he was a charmer but maria had done her homework sure. okay and every time we had to replace the cassette in those days with the U-Matic 20-minute cassette, yeah. so every 20 minutes, excuse me, Maria, we need to change cassette. Fidel was furious. Why, because you had to change, because you no. interrupted the interview? No, he was furious because she was getting to him on the interview. She was asking him all kinds of proving questions. And he was angry. Now, I am a lawyer. Are you willing to talk to me about this subject for hours? I can spend hours right. telling you about it. She was pushing his buttons. Yeah, yeah, she was really pushing his buttons. And to see Fidel angry, because mm -hmm. I never seen that. Well, what's the one of, actually the first time I saw him in person, right. but right. I didn't think that will, he, he will become all flustered. Right. And after we, we said, Maria, we're ready, he will regain his composure. Okay, I, I, this was very significant that we all mm -hmm. saw that. Mm -hmm. And the fact that Maria was doing an excellent job getting to him. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, and so we did the interview and we had been the whole day with him. And this, the interview took place around nine, started at nine. And you know, the interviews with Fidel can go on for hours because he talks. He talks and talks and you mm -hmm. don't stop him. You gotta, no. you know, squeeze in yeah. every bit. So we must have ended the interview by probably close to midnight. We were exhausted. We mm -hmm. had been going with him for, uh, so we're exhausted. We wanted to Wait a minute, back. so you, you did an interview from 9 a.m. to midnight? Yes. See, no, we were, nonstop. Nonstop, the whole day. Okay. With Maria Shriver. Maria, yeah. yeah. When we, we took a little break for lunch, sure. but after that we sure. didn't have dinner. You know, because Fidel, they used to call him the horse. The horse, El Caballo, because he had the stamina of a horse at the time. I, I knew why they called him a horse. He right. wasn't stopping. Right. So after that, we're exhausted, we're hungry, and we're packed. You can imagine this. We, the, the office of Fidel, we build a studio there. We light mm -hmm. it really nice. Sure. 
I love to do lighting. I mm -hmm. always got into lighting, special situation like that. Mm -hmm. And so we're finished, we're packing our equipment, and we're like, oh, the hotel sounds good, you know. Mm -hmm. gotta, and Maria comes and she said, look guys, the president just announced that he's gonna, he has a dinner for us, so we have to stay. And we're like, Maria, can we skip that? <laughs> she goes, no, you can't say no to me. <laughs> you're about to <laughs> deny a dinner invitation from right. Fidel Castro because no, 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 no. you're she just said, over it. Right. <laughs> you're tired. So she said, you guys got it. I'm sorry. She goes, but she was such a sweetheart. You know, we, I understood. Right. So they said, right. okay. So he gave us this dinner, okay, that was fabulous. Mm -hmm. Seafood, mm -hmm. lobster, you name it. And the mojitos and, and daiquiris flowing. Wait, he was there with you guys? Yeah. He, he was, was having dinner and yes. mojitos and you guys yes. are just uh, being yes. merry and having... And this is not filmed anymore. No, this is... This is just... We, right, just civil, talking, just the have, socializing. Right, right. And he went to every single one of us talking, Fidel. So he, you sat with Fidel and had a conversation? Yeah, yeah, we were all there very casually in his office and then the food, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he comes to me, when the time comes to me, he says, uh, you are a Latino, aren't you? Mm -hmm. I said, yes, sir. Uh, he said, where are you from? Mm -hmm. I said, El Salvador. And he goes with his finger, ah, he goes, the best guerrilla fighters in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I started laughing. Uh -huh. I said, but how can you say that, right. Comandante? You, you call him President or Comandante. You right. know? I said, but how can you say that when your guerrilla movement was so successful here right. in Cuba? Mm -hmm. He said, yes, but the Salvadorians didn't have the mountains that we have mm -hmm. to hide. He said, you're from there. You know what I'm talking about. He was like, yeah. He said, they didn't have the big mountains. So well, the strategy that the guerrilla used is they hit the enemy hard and then they blend it with the population, right. which is exactly what the Salvadorians did. So you so, think he learned from that? No, because he's, remember, he was already mm -hmm. in power. And he, no, but he was praising the fact that the guerrillas, remember, he was one of the main supporters of the, of uh, the, the Salvadorian guerrillas. So right. he knew all that. Oh, I see. Actually, the left movement in El Salvador was so divided that they couldn't present a a united front against the government. Mm -hmm. It was Fidel mm -hmm. who unified all the from left to middle, you know, of the political spectrum, put them all together to fight the government. But it was Fidel, the architect, that told them, look, I'm going to give you help, but you got to get your right. stuff together here. So he knew about it, you know. Mm -hmm. So we talk about it. And then he said, have you spent time covering the war? I said, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Have you spent time with the guerrillas in the field? I mm -hmm. said, yes, because mm -hmm. I have. Mm -hmm. Spend time with both the army and in the camps with the guerrillas, mm -hmm. hiding, mm -hmm. constantly hiding from the army. It was mm -hmm. really, that's another story. <laughs> so I told him, yes. <laughs> he said, so he started talking to me, and then he went on talking to everybody. Right. And one thing I noticed is the bodyguards used to pile the food on their dishes mm -hmm. because the food was very scarce in Cuba. So right. they're there probably thinking this is the time to take advantage of the feast. Right. You know, I pointed out to my colleagues, I said, look at the bodyguards, they're taking advantage. They don't of see that every day. No, no, they didn't. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, you know, it was, uh, I mean, what can I say? This, this, uh, I have a picture that you can see, young Fidel. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I saw, I mean, you, know, you have a bunch uh, of uh, amazing photos here that uh, you brought with you. And it was, it was great. After that, I did a few other Stories with Maria Schreiber. Mm -hmm. uh, and you saw Fidel a few more times after that. Yeah, well, after right? that, uh, I was doing a story that had to do with healthcare. Right. And anything that, that, that had to do with healthcare, Fidel was interested. Right. He was so interested. Anything that dealt with healthcare. Yeah. Especially public healthcare. I mean, that's the one thing that you you know Cuba had going for, had going for them. It, they have a pretty decent healthcare system. Well, right? let me tell you, I saw their hospitals when they were the, having the full support of the Soviet Union, which was about three billion dollars a year. Right. And their hospitals were incredible, well equipped, clean, free of charge. Mm -hmm. I saw that with my own eyes. Right. Of course, all that went down the drain because when the Soviets pulled their economic support, Cuba didn't have the means to continue. But when they were being given money by the Soviets, they used it. The hospitals were second to for, none for healthcare, and the, the the medical schools were well equipped. 
As a matter of fact, they have a medical school for students from the rest of Latin America if they wanted to go to Cuba and become right. doctors. Okay, so they did have, oh. you know, they have some top scientists too. Yeah. Yeah. With Maria, he took us to, a, it was called the Lenin School for Gifted Children. The kids that were there in that school were high IQ. Right. They were all handpicked. They were the, the, the the, the pride of the revolution. Right. They were all being trained to become scientists, biologists, yeah. doctors. And Fidel went there and he was like the Beatles going to New York. You should he have seen him. He was a rock this star, kid. huh? He was a rock star. They, we almost got run over by the kids. Right. I saw it with my own eyes, yeah. okay? He was very, I mean, he was popular among, he was among the Cubans. Popular. Yeah. He was popular, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Of course there were people that resented him, but yeah. he was popular. Yeah, he was very popular. Yeah. I know a lot of people here, this the probably thing you, you know, mm -hmm. SOB, but hey, I'm just telling you what I saw. Yeah. Okay. So um, I, before we move on, I, I want to do something, but this is the first time we're doing this, or I'm doing this. It's, it's called rapid fire. So I have a few questions lined up, and I just want you to give me quick answers to them, all right? Okay. And then we'll continue our conversation, okay? okay? All right, here we go. The world's most hospitable place. Well, Costa Rica comes to mind. The most impressive world leader you met? Uh, probably Mother Teresa. You go on an assignment and you're allowed to only come back with either sound or picture, not both. Which one do you bring back? That's a hard one because without sound, the pictures don't say much. And you can only take one. Probably, well, I will have to take pictures. Finish the sentence. When it comes to the news, the world deserves to know because... Knowledge is power. People need to know what's going on. Film or digital? Digital. Mac or PC? Probably Mac. Cool. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> uh, excellent. So, all right. So you did the Cubist thing. You met Fidel a few times. Um, you, you went there to, to interview him. And um, you also covered Haiti as well. Yes. So um, let's talk a little extensively. bit about Extensively. I covered Haiti extensively because mm -hmm. after Papa Doc Duvalier died, he appointed his son to be the next president. So Papa Doc Duvalier is, uh, was, was the, di the dictator, dictator in Haiti. That uh, was put in there in power by mm -hmm. the U.S. Marines, by the way. They gotta, we got to go back in history. Right, here. right. Uh, the Marines were in Haiti for 11 years because... Haiti couldn't pay some money that the U.S. had lent them. Mm -hmm. So we sent the Marines to take over customs to get their money back. Oh and they ended up being 11 years. Mm -hmm. Okay. As a matter of fact, the little infrastructure that existed in Haiti was built by the U.S. Army, the right. Marines. Right. So they founded the Haitian Army and installed Papa Doc Duvalier. Because mm -hmm. in those days, the U.S. was happy to get any government or any president that told them i gonna watch your back for communism and that's all they wanted to know i mean it was cold war cold um, war yeah. yeah and mm -hmm. the u.s yeah. wasn't interested if these people were dictators they were brutal they didn't have any conscience they abused their people as long as they cover the u.s back against communism they were happy right okay and these dictators used that to get economic and military aid very effective from, from the, the US. US. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they will say, look, our mm -hmm. army is, is defenseless. Mm -hmm. The communists will take over. And then, so here comes the military aid. So that's how the Haitian army was established. Mm -hmm. But the Papa Doc was a dictator. He was a right. doctor. Okay, right. they used voodoo to intimidate his people. Yeah. And when he had a massive heart attack, he appointed his son. There were no elections. He's, he was called Baby Doc Duvalier. So there was a lot of turmoil in Haiti, a lot of turmoil, bloody turmoil. He mm -hmm. will send the troops to massacre the people. So we will be going to Haiti covering this quite often. And you found yourself in dangerous situations oh, there as well? In Haiti, I was kidnapped one time by the Tonton Makuts. I don't know if you know who the Tonton Makuts were. No, but you're about to tell me. The Tonton Makuts was the personal repressive army of baby Doc Duvalier. He was founded by his father. They had nothing to do with the army. They were mm -hmm. an independent, brutal, mm -hmm. repressive armed force mm -hmm. that responded only to the president. Okay, and their barracks was next to the presidential palace in Port-au-Prince. That tells you how close they were. Right. But the Tom Tom Macus were feared because they terrorized the population. They stole everything from them. They took vehicles. They took. They were 
you know, they whatever did, they wanted, whatever they wanted, they got away without with it. any fear of being held accountable no, by anybody. There was no accountability for the army. Never mind for the, the Tonto Makut. So they were feared in Haiti. Okay, right. and we all knew about it because I knew the history of Haiti. Yeah. So one time we're in Port-au-Prince and we heard of a massacre that the army and the Makuts have done in some town about 30 miles from Port-au-Prince. So mm -hmm. we decided, okay. We're going to go there. We're going to go and see if we can, if we can see anything. Mm -hmm. So we started traveling, and about 10 miles out of, the, out of the city, there is a checkpoint. Soldiers, you know, regular Haitian army. Mm -hmm. And they say, no, you can't go on. And we were expecting something like that, because it's yeah. always, you know, trying to stop the press from seeing things. So we were there and trying to, we had a female producer that was fluent in French, Mm -hmm. So she started talking to them in French, and some were talking to her in French, but when they didn't want her to know what was going on, they switched to Creole, mm -hmm. which is very hard to understand unless you're a native Haitian, right. you know. So we were there uh, trying to convince the soldiers to let us through, and this is about half an hour, and then a CVS crew arrived. Mm -hmm. We were all running into each other in all these countries, you know, They're friends of mine. They show up and park behind us, and they too wanted to go True. So, the 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 the, the lieutenant, the uh, Haitian lieutenant, kept saying, "No, no, no, you can't go on. No, no." Right. Then all of a sudden, they left. The soldiers left, like somebody called them. And here comes the this guy in blue uniform, the Makuts. I don't know. I mean, it happened. They all came. They weren't friendly at all. You know, they had this. People claim that they used to be given some drugs or something. Their eyes were very red, and they had the meanest look. And they were armed to their teeth, you know, machine guns, pistols, and huge knives, okay? So they all came, and they said, okay, you're all under arrest. Just like that. And we're how, many of, how many of you was there at the uh, time? For us, we were, let's see, one, two, the producer, three for NBC, and two people for CBS, plus their driver, who was Haitian. Okay. There were two networks. Two networks, two, yeah. Yeah, okay. Right. They, they were my friends, you know. Right. I knew them. They were from Miami, these guys. Right. So uh, I remember the sound man had, a, had an earring, <laughs> right. a big diamond earring, right. a young sound man, you know. He was just starting. And I look at this, and I'm thinking, oh, man, what a place to have this. These guys are thieves. And I told him, I said, Tony, get that damn ear of you before somebody cut your ear off with a knife. Oh, but my girlfriend gave it to me. I said, no, man, just take it off, please. Right, right. Don't provoke these people. But anyway, so one man could jump in the cabin, in the passenger seat of mm -hmm. each vehicle, and they put us all in the back, and our driver drove, okay? So they took over. There were some other guys. They had a vehicle in front of the two vehicles, CBS and NBC, and another vehicle at the end. So we're, we're headed back to Port-au-Prince. And but, I'm very scared. So, so you, at this point, they're basically taking control. You, you can't, you're detained. You can't go anywhere. No. And you don't know what they're about to do. We have no idea what they're about to do. All I know is these people have the worst reputation ever. Okay? We're, nobody's talking. Our producer is trying to talk to them in French. They wouldn't even answer her. They weren't even interested in mm -hmm. answering. Mm -hmm. Okay? And we're all very concerned. I'm thinking, oh, my God, what's going to happen? We're mm -hmm. going to end up getting killed. Nobody knows that we're being kidnapped. Nobody knew that. Right. Here's the twist, okay? This is out of a, a, out of a novel, uh -huh. okay? As they've driven us back, remember I told you the their, their, their barracks was next to mm -hmm. the palace, mm -hmm. which is downtown in, in port au mm -hmm. So as we're heading their barracks, okay, the owner of the vehicle that we were riding on, right. because most of the vehicles were owned by private individuals because we couldn't get enough rentals, but private individuals that had two, three vehicles, they would rent one of those, one of those four-wheel drive you know, SUVs for the network. So ours, the owner, was a private owner. So this man sees his vehicle, and he sees the Makut riding, and he's thinking, that's it. They stole my vehicle. These white people have my vehicle stolen because right. the Banco stole everything. Right. So this man is really upset. Mm -hmm. He calls the NBC office and he said, he talks to somebody and he said, 
So who's going to pay for my vehicle? Mm -hmm. And the MB said, what, what do you mean? What, what happened to your vehicle? This yeah. is a crude vehicle. No, 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 no. You don't understand. The Makuts got them. I saw them. And they're going to steal my vehicle. And you people are going to pay for it. Right. So at this point, the NBC is really concerned when he heard the Makuts. So they started mobilizing. They call New York. New York called the State Department. The State Department. We didn't know any of this. Where are you at at this time? At this point, I think we were inside. The guy saw us when we were entering the, the barracks. Oh, so, so they drove you guys to the barracks? They drove us to, to the, the barracks. In, next to the presidential palace. Right. And what, where did you, were you put in there? Uh, we were put in, in this room, a mm -hmm. nondescript room that mm -hmm. only had two plastic chairs, empty. Okay? Only one door, one door and small windows that were sealed. And they um, locked you in there? Yeah, they put us all in there. Okay, the, including, including the, uh, the Haitian drivers. Mm -hmm. Our driver was an older man by the name of Joseph, very gentle individual that mm -hmm. spoke English, you know. Right. So they put us in this room. We're thinking, oh my God, we're gonna be tortured here. I'm thinking right. they're definitely gonna torture us. Right. Okay, because wh what else are we doing here? Right. But we're thinking that nobody knows. Right. They can torture us, kill us, make us disappear. Nobody will ever know. At this point, I'm really, really concerned. You know, and I tried to talk to Joseph I, because Joseph could hear when we arrived what they were saying in Creole. And poor mm -hmm. Joseph didn't even want to tell me. Okay. You know, he was so scared. Okay. And the other driver for CBS, he wasn't even speaking. Right. But Joseph said, Louis, he said, they're going to kill you. They're going to kill us all. They're talking how they're going to get rid of the bodies, which is easy in Haiti. I <laughs> mean, you just dump you in the ocean and that's the end of you. That's all Joseph said to me. He said, I can't talk. I can't talk. I figured, you know what? We're gone. We're done. So at this point, you're thinking, okay, so this is the last few hours, minutes that I yeah. have to spend. On, on They're gonna how does it make, like, how do you feel, like, oh at that moment God, when you think you, you know it's going to be over soon? It's hard to tell you what, what you're thinking. You know, you're just thinking, how am I going to get out of this one? Did anybody, how are they going to find out? What, you know, all these things, and what are they going to do to us? Why are we here? And then we're in the middle of all this when boom, the door opens and three Makuts walked in there. They had this mean look on their faces. And they will go and call every one of us and put it on, ask you to stand up. We were laying, you know, mm -hmm. sitting on the floor. And they will be right in front of your face. One guy was in front of my face with these red looking eyes. Mm -hmm. And he had a very sharp knife and a, and a wooden stick. And he's peeling the wooden stick and the pieces are falling on me, right in front of me, just watching me, mm -hmm. not saying anything. Intimidating you. Yes, then he goes, then I will sit down and start with the other one. They were doing this. So at this point I knew we were, we were done. You know, they were intimidating us. Okay, we were really scared. You know, the female producer who's a mm -hmm. dear friend of mine, he's still around. Mm -hmm. uh, we were talking and he said, uh, Nicole, mm -hmm. I don't know, you know, nobody's going to know. I bet you the network, NBC, nobody knows, CBS. Uh, but at this point, yes, they had started the wheels rolling, you know. And the State Department immediately got in touch with the, with the Haitian mm -hmm. government. They said, you guys have journalists in your hands. If something happened, there's going to be hell to pay. Mm -hmm. Okay, because you kill an American journalist and it's going to explode in, mm -hmm. in the U.S. You guys are doing a disservice to your own country and your own army. Don't touch those people. Right. But remember, you're talking to the government. Mm -hmm. The Makuts were an independent force. They were on their own. So the government could be like, we got nothing to do yeah, with that. Yeah, the government could have said, we, we don't have no have control them. over over the Makuts. Right. He right. could have said, we don't have it, mm -hmm. which is what they do when people disappear. Right. We didn't know. Right. We didn't do it. You know. But, uh, and so the guy will left. And then here is something that happened that was out of a, out of a movie, out of the, the banana movies by Woody Allen, mm -hmm. okay, because it was so stupid. At now that I look back, it mm -hmm. was stupid. I didn't make any sense, but... It, remember, we're terrified. At this point, mm -hmm. we know it's just a matter of time before somebody comes and starts slashing our throat with right. those knives. Right. They come, the two Makuts come and put a table, a wooden table in the middle of the room, and then another guy follows with a reel-to-reel -reel recorder, okay, and sets it on the table and get an extension cord. I'm thinking, 
they going to beat the daylas out of us and interrogate. The, I'm thinking, what is the tape recorder right. for? Right. <laughs> then to, to our surprise or amusement, if you want right. to call it amusement, we're an amuse, he turns on the record, the, the reel to reel, and some classical music begins to play. <laughs> and then they left the room. We're thinking, now oh, this is so surreal. What the hell is going on? Right. We were in there for a few hours. Listening okay. to classical music. Yeah. And every now and then, the Makuts will come and do the same thing, you know, intimidate us or mm -hmm. put the guns, get the guns, start playing with the, with the pistol in front of us on our yeah. face. Uh, and we were, at this point, we were beyond being scared. I mean, right. we know we're goners, okay? Until about maybe around 6.30 in the afternoon, the door opens, and here is a, a, an army captain, mm -hmm. army. No from more Makuts. From the government. From the government, followed by these three tall Americans from the embassy. And we're like, oh, my God, you know, we're being rescued here. And the Americans came to us and talked to every single one of us and mm -hmm. said, uh, have you been mistreated in any way? Or from mm -hmm. I told them just intimidation, right. psychological intimidation, but I, they really didn't touch us, okay? Right. And... Uh, one of the guys was the political attaché of the American embassy. He turned around to the captain and he said, Captain, this is illegal. You know, this is illegal what you're doing. Hey. You're holding this journalist. Yeah. He, he said, if they have committed a crime, mm -hmm. you have the right to charge them. Right. And we have the right to get a lawyer to get them out. Sure. You can't just detain them. And, and the captain didn't know what to say. He spoke English. Mm -hmm. He kept apologizing to us. I'm so I'm sorry, there was a misunderstanding, you know. Uh, they were looking for somebody else, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Well, anyways, we, we, they, they took us out, and believe me, I wow. went back to the bureau. Talk about relief. And then we put two and two together. That what saved our lives was the owner seeing his vehicle being taken by the Makuts. Calling the news. Calling the network, saying, who's going to pay for my vehicle? He wasn't concerned about us. He was concerned about, about his, car. His, his vehicle. Yeah. yeah. But that's what saved our wow. lives. Incredible. I'm talking about it, scary. I mean, man, you you put yourself in these like put and look when you're going out there, you you know where you're going. You know that there is a chance that something like this Could may happen, happen right? Yeah. Um, I guess what I'm trying to like find out is like why you know like what what is it? It takes a certain personality, I think, to want to go out there and and it's like is it courage? Is it curiosity? Is it you know what is it? You know what? It was more curiosity and also the fact that you think that what you're doing is important mm -hmm. because the news are going to be shown all over the United States and Americans right. need to know what's going on. Yeah. There were many instances that I used to think, why didn't I stay in L.A. working as an auditor? Right. Okay, why am I here? Yeah. I yeah. have a profession that yeah. was very successful accountant. Right. And then, of course, the voice inside me will say, well, you're here because you enjoy what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Every now and then there's going to be a situation like this. Yeah. But, yeah, I did enjoy seeing, you know, the result of our work. In 94, 95, right. this is when you're recovering something very, you know, not well known. It's called the Operation Uphold Democracy right. in, in Haiti. Right. Um, that's, what, that's when you received this award right. for uh, journalism and excellence. Uh, right, from because the, we were covering the, uh, after the invasion... Oh, Haiti, the, the, the U.S. troops came in. Actually, you know, it was pretty close for, for ma major violence to happen uh, because, uh, you know, the army wasn't given up. You know, the, the U.S. wanted them to leave, okay? They wanted the, the dictator at the time. Cedras mm -hmm. was Colonel General Cedras was the one in power. And the U.S. wanted to get him out mm -hmm. so they could go about free elections. But Sedras wasn't giving up. And the 82nd Airborne was already ready to deploy in an invasion. We knew that because we had connections with it. So uh, real quick, let's, let's put this in context. So there was a, uh, who was it that was in power at the time? There was a coup. There was a coup. Or, the and government was overthrown, was pushed out. But it was thrown out of power. Got and it. the man in charge with the strong man was uh, General Cedras. Yes. And he was a stubborn SOB. He didn't want to leave. Right. And it was a United Nations sanctioned 
uh, yes. uh, operation, right. right? And like you mentioned, so the, 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 the military planes were already on the way. They were already on the way, okay? We knew these to people. To reinstate the, the government. And to kick the, the democratic, draft for Right, the yes. democratically elected president back right. into power and get rid of the... Uh, yes. the person that said Russ, said and Russ, yeah. it was Clinton that wanted to, to change him, get mm -hmm. him out of there. Mm -hmm. They even sent President Carter to try to convince them and to leave peacefully. Right. They offered him millions of dollars and mentioned in Panama. And he didn't want to go. Dictators don't, don't like he to leave. The the power. Yeah. They like the power more than anything else. Yes, they like the power too much. Mm -hmm. So we knew it was just a matter of time before the, our troops started landing in Haiti, kicking some real butt, okay? But then Sedras finally gave up. They have to turn the invasion around, I want you to know. That's how close it was. They were in the air, already on the way. Right. And they had to turn around because he came to his senses. Right. Because he knew that was going to So play in this out well. time, is, is, you know, all hell is breaking loose, mm -hmm. okay? And uh, I, at this point, later on, I was with the ABC News. Mm -hmm. And ABC, at this point, was spending a lot of resources. They own Haiti. Mm -hmm. I was working with Linda Petillo. Mm -hmm. She she owned Haiti, okay, and I was one of her crews. Actually, me and this other guy were her favorite crew, because we we always use. I always like to use filmmaking in my, you know. Uh, I knew the story well again, and Linda will say, Louis, uh, since you're my producer, sound man, mm -hmm. this is what I'm saying on the stand up. You know the stand up that they do on TV. Yeah. Can you find a nice background? Because I insisted that whatever the stand-up you're saying, let's find the right background. So the picture is very powerful. Right. So she loved that. So she will send me, tell me what it is, and I will go with the cameraman and the driver and find mm -hmm. the right background. And radio back, Linda, we're in such and such. Right. She will show up, do the stand-up, loved it, loved it. Cool. New York really loved us. And so she said, well, it's my crew. So she right. called us my crew. We were in with this nice. woman. Nice. And we were kicking NBC's butt. Right. Some of my ex-colleagues. Yeah, your former, you know? your former employee. Yeah, employee. they used yeah. to come. This one of the top correspondents, and I said, sad look one day, and he said, Louie, how bad are you going to kick my butt today? <laughs> <laughs> I said, <"Bet."> right. <laughs> I said, Paul, I hate to tell you, but it's going to be bad because we have some good stories. We own Haiti. Because right. they had the resources. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No I even suggested, you know, to Linda, I said, we need to have some, uh, it's like a military operation. Mm -hmm. Running a bureau, a news bureau, it's like running a military operation. You have to have intelligence gathering. Mm -hmm. And by that is, you have to have a local guy that speak, a local Haitian that speak right. Creole and English, sure. listening to all the radio stations so they can tell us immediately what's happening. Yeah. And I instituted that, and Linda said, that's a great idea. So right. we had a guy that knew exactly what was going right. on in the country. Right. So we were super connected, okay? And that's why we won the award. Awesome. Well, congratulations. That's a, that's a nice one to yeah, win. Yeah, that was a nice sure. award. It's, it's yeah. definitely meaningful. Um, so then, you know, I mean, if that wasn't enough, you know, you, you certainly didn't have enough. In, well, in there is one more war, the Falklands War. Oh, the Falklands War in Argentina. You know, that was a major, yeah. major war because there was almost going back to the colonial time when the colonial power mm -hmm. was invading Latin America. Right. <laughs> I was in El Salvador, you know, covering the war when my boss, the bureau chief, calls me on the phone. He goes, immediately, come mm -hmm. to Miami and you're turning around, you're mm -hmm. saying goodbye to your wife, you're going to Argentina, you're covering the Falklands War. <laughs> and we're like, what? What is the, what is the Falklands? Right. Because Argentina just invaded those, those islands. It was just the beginning. Where, geographically speaking, are the Falklands The Falklands islands? are on the South Atlantic. they way out there in the middle of the Atlantic, south of Buenos Aires. I'm telling you, by plane, in an Air Force, Argentine Air Force plane, it took us three hours to get to right. the island. Right. So that tells you the distance, yeah. okay? Yeah. This is islands in the middle of nowhere. Why was it so important to Argentina? Because traditionally, if you are an Argentine, you learn things kindergarten. That they, they, they don't call it the Falcon, they call it Las Malvinas. Right. They call it Las, the islands Malvinas are ours. They were ours, they will be ours, they're always ours. It was Argentine pride. Mm -hmm. And also the military using that because their economy was in shambles. The people were protesting against the government. And what does the, the president do when, when the, the people doesn't like you? You invade the country mm -hmm. and then you unify them. 
And that's exactly what the, the Argentine military did. Right. You know, because they were all passionate about those islands are ours and the British are invading their colonial power. So much so, you know how stupid that is the behind the scenes that you learn later on. Mm -hmm. The UK was about to give those islands back to Argentina right. because it was costing them too, too much, much money, money to support they them. They were losing. When yeah. the Argentines invaded, then mm -hmm. Margaret Thatcher said, that's it. Mm -hmm. We're not allowing a thin horn dictator tell right. the great UK. Right. You know, never mind that the UK was in decline. I right. hate to say it, but that's the truth. You know, they didn't have an aircraft carrier. They had just uh, 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 a mouthball, the, the uh, uh, Royal Ark aircraft carrier that they had, the only one. Right. They just had decommissioned it. They were going to start cutting it down. <laughs> so they go, wait a minute, don't destroy it. We're right. going to need it. Right. We're about they, to start a war here. Yeah, they <laughs> were in bad shape, the, yeah. the naval yeah. forces in, in the UK. Cause they Which were, is crazy because that's one of their biggest prides in their prime uh, was... The you know, naval their, forces. The naval forces. They were the supreme. They were the strongest, right? Yeah. I mean, not even, there was not even a close second. Not even close. Yeah. Nobody could get close to them. Right. And here is Argentina, right. this dictatorship, smacking them on the face. Yeah. And they didn't even have the ships to go to. Right. <laughs> it was really right. funny. It's embarrassing. Yeah. Okay, embarrassing. Yeah. So we flew to Miami and directly to Argentina, you know. But this was a, a really hard war to cover because the action was in the islands. Mm -hmm. And like I just told you, it's three hours away. Not easy to get to. Not easy to get to. Mm -hmm. At this point, the networks were competing with each other so much that money didn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you how far this went. The CBS was seriously considering uh, uh, leasing a, a ship to see if they could go around the islands, which was stupid because it was being patrolled by submarines. Right. But they wanted to get a ship to see if they could go closer. And the UK said, no, that's a bad idea. And so did the Argentine. You right. just don't go there with the ship. But that's how competitive it was. So I arrived in Buenos Aires, and there must have been 10 or 11 NBC crews. We had a huge staff. This right. is a big war. Right. And all the other networks, the same thing. It was, a, I mean, they were spending millions on dollars. Mm -hmm. But we weren't getting anything other than the Argentine preparations in Buenos Aires. But after you film that, the story was to go to the islands, right. okay? And so we're going now, you know, about a week or two, and here comes this correspondent by the name Robin Lloyd. Mm -hmm. He was uh, a fairly young reporter for NBC, handsome guy, Robert Redford looked mm -hmm. like, you know, very spelt, really nice looking American guy fluent in Spanish. Mm -hmm. He had a degree in Latin American studies, and he was fluent, but he spoke Spanish with the Mexican accent, with the sing-song, because yeah. he had lived in Mexico for a number of okay. years. But he was fluent. Right. So Robin came to me, and at the time, at the Miami Bureau, if you can believe that, we were covering Latin America, mm -hmm. and there were only two people that spoke Spanish and English. Mm -hmm. He was Robin Lloyd and myself. Right which is stupid, we should have had more people bilingual, but we didn't. Right. So Robin comes to me and he said, Louis, he said, you know, I've been in conversations with the Argentine high command to take us to the island. He goes, but he's taking, it's an uphill battle trying to convince this colonel that has the key for us to go. Would you come with me and, and help me? I said, yeah. So I started going with him and I appealed to the colonel by saying, okay, you know, you always had this animosity with the United States. Yeah. And this is an opportunity for you to allow a network crew like us to go and show the world what you're capable of doing. Your military has taken over. I said, wouldn't that be great, Colonel? <laughs> I got him that way. Well. And that, that did something. And then he gave me a big lecture about how Latin America was, was going to get united against the mm. Yankees and, you know, all this. I touched his Argentine superiority complex. <laughs> and the guy, I know this, you know, but he didn't say yes. So we, mm. it took about another week or two weeks going every other day trying to convince the man. Mm. So one time he said, okay, he can go, pointing at Robin. I said, mm -hmm. the minimum we need is three people. Right. He said, no, okay, I'll allow you two people. I said, no, we can't do that. I even said to Robin, you wanna, I'll give you a quick training how to do right. uh, sound. That way you and the cameraman can go. 
Robin said, no, nonsense. You he can't. said, not only do I need good sound, but I need your yeah. head, yeah. okay, to help me with this. We got to do it together. Yeah. So finally, after like two weeks, uh, the colonel said, okay, mm-hmm. okay. He said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, get you uh, space in the C-130. Mm-hmm. He Which said, is a, a, a military yeah, aircraft. Right, the, the, the cargo Transport plane. The cargo plane, right. He said, but it's going to be just one day. In and out. He said, take it or leave it. Oh, we took it. Right. Okay. Of course he did. So we went back to the bureau, and my boss here in Miami had taken over the bureau in Buenos Aires. That's how important it was, that right. order. That bureau chief flew. He was wow. in charge. So he came to me, the cameraman, and Robin, and he said, okay, guys. He said, this is a great opportunity. Mm-hmm. And if we can pull it together, we're going to kick some royal butt mm-hmm. with the other network. Right. It was always a competition, too, wasn't Super. it? Super. The competition you was... You always wanted to get a better shot. You want to get better coverage, the better the, background. The first one Better on access. The story. Yes. The first the, one at the story. The first one at the story. I mean, it was almost like that was your motivation. It's right. Like, the present was right. important. Yeah. So he said, from now on, you guys are... Go- you're not going to do anything. Uh, the schedule was a week later. He said, this week, he said, I'm going to give you $2,000 each. Go and buy winter clothes mm-hmm. because it's going to be cold, mm-hmm. really cold. Mm-hmm. And prepare your gear and not a word right. to anybody, not even your friends, the other crews. Because somebody gets drunk, starts blabbing, and then CVS gets wind of it, ABC, then that's it. So we couldn't tell anybody. Right. That must have okay. killed you too. And this week was very stressful for me because I started thinking, okay, we need batteries to power everything. Right. And the cold weather. So I got some pouches built that I can put the, the batteries right. around me. And we went shopping for really, really expensive winter gear, you mm-hmm. know, uh, boots and everything. So when the time came, we took the C-130, mm-hmm. okay, and uh, we had a minder. You know what a minder is? Minder, mind this, mind that. You know, somebody like, like uh, somebody like keeping an eye on right. us, make sure we didn't film something they didn't want right. to. They assigned this colonel, a full colonel of, mm-hmm. the, of the Argentine army mm-hmm. to be with us. He was, you know, equipped for the winter and everything. Mm-hmm. Anyways, uh, Three and a half hours later, we're landing in, right. in Port San Carlos, they call it. Stanley, Port Stanley in English, Port San, Puerto San Carlos. And we landed, and the military activity was amazing. Okay, planes coming and going. Uh, Argentina had super there, French and Mirage fighters. And I saw uh, a fleet of planes flying with mm-hmm. the Argentine Air Force marking. And we're filming all this, and I'm thinking, Oh my God, this is going to be a real war. You know, I saw the um, uh, uh, Argentine Marines equipped with, with winter. I mean, I'm thinking this is a real war. You know, this is not a counterinsurgency that we've been doing in Central. This right. is a real shooting war right. uh, and a lot of activity. Okay, so we were filming everything. 18 degrees below zero. Oh, cold. It was so cold. And my concern is the gear, how the gear doesn't right. go down with this right. weather. So uh, from the airport, we got our gear and we put it in storage because it was just one day. Yeah. At night, we were going back. To, oh, wow. You know, so we have to squeeze every minute of it. Right. So they, they gave us a vehicle and the colonel was with us. Yeah. He lasted maybe 10 minutes, the colonel. What do you mean? He, he said, look, him. guys, this is too much. This is too cold. Right. Said, you're on your own. That was fantastic because we were just the three of us. Right. And you could do whatever we you wanted. We could do and film whatever we wanted. Awesome. Okay? Yeah. And we were going the town. The Port Stanley is not a big town. Mm-hmm. So we were going around. And as we're filming, here comes this Mini Cooper. Mm-hmm. In those days, we didn't have those cars here. Right. You know, the British Mini yeah, Cooper. Yeah, yeah. Here comes this woman driving really wild in a Mini Cooper. And she, she sees and she comes to a screeching halt. And comes out with the eyes wide right. open, and he goes, "Are you? Are you? Where are you? Who are you?" I said, "Ma'am, we're an American Network News crew." Mm-hmm. Oh my God! She started screaming, "Oh, these people are animals! These Argentines are stealing our food! 
man, I put the microphone in front of her, started asking her, I'm so mm-hmm. quiet. This woman was going not, and then she went, please, Margaret Thatcher, if you can hear us, send the troops. Somebody claimed that Thatcher saw that, and she said, that's it, we're going in. This woman was so dramatic, okay. We were getting this incredible... You would have never gotten that interview with that colonel still no, being No, the colonel did. He would have... No, he was never. the censor. Yeah. He was there to censure us. Censure, yeah. You know, yeah. So, and then uh, we filmed all kinds of stuff. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the columns of Argentine troops look very impressive. Right. And uh, the Argentine main the counterinsurgency plane, the Pucaras, the propeller, the driven plane, really... Right. Flying around, you know, really impressive. Right, okay? right. And, a and lot of activity, a lot of military activity. A lot activity. of military activity, mm-hmm. yes. Uh, and then, of course, the presence. You got to do a stand up with your correspondent. Right. And we, I said to Rami, I said, we got to do several. That way, New York can choose the one, one with the Argentine flag in the right. background in Port Stanley, right. with the Argentine flag flying. Okay, another one. Uh, by the airport, when you see the background of planes, very dramatic stuff. Where were the British at the time? The British were two weeks away. Right. Okay. They were massing up their fleet out in the ocean. Okay. Because they didn't have, they figured, well, we need to use the Air Force to soften up all the targets yeah. before we send the troops in. Right. So they were doing that. Okay. Right. They were beginning to organize. Uh, so the time came to go back. You know, they said, okay gather your stuff. I have taken two video cassette recorders mm-hmm. in case one failed right. as a protection. That gave me the capability. Remember, it's three and a half hours to fly sure. back. So the colonel is there. Again, he just looked over our shoulder a little bit of what we had. Right. And the Archbishop of Buenos Aires was there in the same plane. And I started rough cutting from one one ten to another, just the highlights. Okay, because I didn't want to have too many cassettes to feed, you know, when we got to the feed point, right. the satellite with New York. Right. So I got probably 10 minutes of some, inc- I mean, incredible stuff. I got the best, you know. So by the time we landed, I have one cassette out of all the ones we had. Filmed. That had all the best. Stuff right, on. all the best. Mm-hmm. Okay, and uh, I'm coordinating this uh, with Robin as soon as we arrived. You know, we get to a phone. There were no cell phones in those days. So we called the NBC Bureau, and they uh, they said, okay, what's going on? They said, go to such and such a place. Mm -hmm. The satellite is up. It's been up for over an hour. Ready, ready. So I arrived in a studio like this, and uh, they said, okay, Louis, here's New York. They give me the Mm -hmm. the phone. I go, hey, New York. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Louis, you got the tape? I say, yes. Okay, ready? So send the tape. And all I can hear, the technician, the engineer in New York, holy cow, oh my God, holy cow. <laughs> okay, and uh, I said, well, did you get it, everything? And he goes, yes, but normally they do do another pass or do right. another three pass, make sure you got it. Right. Once he told me the good night that they said, okay, guys, you're wonderful, we got everything. Oh my God, this is incredible. Let me tell you, I had been going on adrenaline for a week Okay, because the, the responsibility was tremendous. We just couldn't right. fail. Right. It was an opportunity yes. of a lifetime. Can you imagine yeah. coming back, well, the camera broke down? Well, they would have accepted it because that's normal, no. mm-hmm. but we just couldn't. Right. So after that, it's like all that stress was came down on me, and I was ready to just crash, all three of us. Wow. So we went to the hotel, and... I just jump in bed. I just, you know, uh-huh. oh, must have been around three in the morning. The phone is ringing off the hook. I know I'm groggy. I'm right. like out of it. I mean, it's like I don't even know what the hell, where I right. am. Picked up the phone. Hey, you guys, it's our boss. It's the bureau chief. Right. <laughs> he goes, you guys are my heroes. Wow. It was awesome. New York is celebrated. We're kicking us. You guys, anything you want. And I could barely, because I was still tired. (laughs) I said, okay, Don, thank you so much. (laughs) I appreciate it. You're my guys, man. He talked to every single one of them. Okay, so we all slept. 
The next morning, we got the details. Well, mm -hmm. New York hit it really hard, and the other networks no. went bananas, okay? They were mad at their people. How dare you right. drop the ball? NBC went there. Yeah. But there is another thing that I forgot to tell you. When we arrived at the airport, the air base, there were crews always there, or crews from all the network, right. watching the planes coming and going. Yeah. So we, have, we arrived, and from the window of the plane, I can see a dear, produ dear friend producer, friend of mine mm -hmm. for ABC, and another producer for CBS. Mm -hmm. And there was a crew for NBC. Right. The crew from NBC didn't know anything about us because yeah. it was a big secret. Yeah. But when they see the shipping bags with NBC News and all the equipment, the other crew's eyes are like this. <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and I can see the two producers back there. And when we, they see us walking out of the plane, my friend, the producer for ABC goes, are you, are you coming from there? Mm -hmm. That's all he made. I go, yes. Couldn't believe they it. were, oh yeah, my God. Yeah, that, wow, hit, that oh, must have been a highlight in your That experience. was a super highlight. Yeah. But the next day, you know, when I really got to talk, we kicked butt so much. Wow. Okay, Then ABC and CBS started putting tremendous right. pressure on the Argentine. You too can be seen. That's no fair. What about us? So yeah. about a week later, we were in this, uh, this town called Comodoro Rivadavia, which is way south of Buenos Aires. This is a huge... Mm -hmm. Air base, Argentine air base. Mm -hmm. And they were thinking that the British were going to hit that air base sooner right. or later, so they kept us there. NBC said, okay, protectively, you guys stay there. And Robin, they sent Robin back and they sent another, Ike Siemens, another season reporter to stay with us. But there was nothing else to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, Ike, the reporter, came, he was, you guys preempted the war. Right. <laughs> you went over there and right. came back with the goods. You know, so um, we weren't incredible. doing much after that. Then the uh, the order came for, for us to move to Uruguay, mm -hmm. Montevideo, which is the country next door to Argentina. Right. Because the Argentine government was so pissed about the coverage that they wanted to throw all U.S. media out. So my boss said, you guys deserve a good rest. You are the heroes of this. Go to uh, uh, Asuncion, go to uh, Uruguay, Montevideo is the name right. of the capital city. Go to Montevideo and secure hotel uh, uh, vehicles and everything. Right. The infrastructure, in case we have to move, we have everything. So we went to Montevideo. We had like 15, 20 rooms on the name of NBC. Mm -hmm. We had a fleet of drivers all waiting for the contingent to move. Right. And well, that's it. You know, the biggest thing we have to do is, where are we going to go to dinner tonight? <laughs> And all the correspondents yeah. are like, you guys, you know, from NBC. You guys they, were the heroes. You were the, we were the biggest heroes. Yeah. And you know what? That yeah. changed my career. Right. All of us careers. Right. Okay. People are taking notice now. You're making a name for yourself, right? This was like three years after I had started with NBC. Right. You know, this was pretty quickly. Yeah. Okay. I'll tell you how much it, it, it did change. The Robin Lloyd was... Uh, stationed in uh, in Mexico City, covering mm -hmm. Latin America, but he was tired of being in Mexico. He wanted to move somewhere. Right. Yeah, he kept requesting the transfer, but they didn't say, no, no, no. After that, New York said, where do you want to go? Mm -hmm. Anywhere in the world. So he requested to be in London, and London is a highly coveted. They gave it to him. For me and the, rep uh, the cameraman, right. after that, right. a bureau chief, just gave us the best assignments. Right. Okay, meaning the top correspondents for NBC and the documentary unit of NBC, which is exactly what I wanted to be. Right, it. right. You know, special segments, they call it mini documentary or documentary unit. Nice. So I started nice. working with some of the top people. Awesome. And, you know, my bureau chief couldn't say enough about us. After that, believe me, it was like, beautiful for me. I couldn't believe yeah. somebody was paying me this great money to do what I absolutely mm -hmm. loved to right. do. Right. You know? Nothing better. And nothing better than that. Yeah. But that was a big, big wow. bump in our careers. That's I can tell you. After that, it's like the world. That was a pivoting moment for you. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, your crew that you were with. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. I had mentioned to you that ABC and CBS arrived at this town after we came back because they wanted to go to the island. Right. Uh, but unfortunately, this happened about a week, a week and a half after we went. 
they send some of the best reporters and crews, okay, to be in this town, Comodoro, and from there they were going to go to the island right. the, the same way we did. Yeah. But they weren't taken anymore because the British fleet was too close, and the Argentine needed all the supplies they could muster to bring to the island before the invasion, so they didn't have any more room in those C-130. Right. So we ended up being the only the only Western journalist to wow. set foot on the island. Our competition couldn't even go, and they were wow. furious. Oh, they were must have been pissed. Oh, yeah. they were furious, yeah. okay? The only o other entity that NBC shared the video is the BBC, because they had a contract with the BBC. Right, right. Br British Broadcasting sure. Corporation. Sure. And, uh, you know, it's funny because uh, after a f years after, right before I retired, I even worked for the BBC. I worked for all of them. Right. You name it. And oh, yeah. You, you probably know, you name yeah, it. done it. Yeah. 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 So, okay. So after the Falkland War Wars and, and you, the coverage of that, you, you also did some domestic, like, you know, U.S. Uh, work, yes, right? Yes. A me lot a of about domestic that. stuff yeah. and then more documentary uh, situations. Uh, for example, uh, the documentary unit of, of NBC did a documentary about the situation in Central America. The, the, the fighting was still going on right. after we came back from the Falklands. Yeah. If anything, the fighting in El Salvador was getting even worse right. because the, the U.S. had supplied a lot of weapons, training, helicopters. They were all over the place. Uh, and then the, the Contra war was increasing. So yeah. Central America was on fire. Right. So we spent a lot of time there. But then they also started doing documentaries related to Latin America. One that was very important, uh, that, that really uh, interests me because I'm a, a history buff and mm -hmm. um, getting into geopolitics. We did a documentary based on the, based on the love-hate relationship between Mexico and the U.S. But you get into the history where the U.S. invaded Mexico mm -hmm. to the point that the main plaza in Mexico City called El Zócalo. Mm -hmm. That's where the uh, presidential palace is, along with an old uh, church that the Spanish... What does El Zócalo mean? El Zócalo is like a place, like a, you know, mm -hmm. it's a main, main plaza, right. okay? The, there was, uh, we had a, an old black and white picture. Right of the presidential palace with the U.S. flag flying on top of it. The American forces had taken over. In Mexico. Yes, Mexico during the City. Mexican, yeah, Mexico City. Right. That's how far they got. Wow. This is uh, years ago during the Mexican Yeah, what America, year are we talking about here? In the 1800s, right. late 1800s, sure. you sure. know. So the Mexicans always had this uneasy relationship, and, and this documentary went deep into it, yeah. the history of Mexico and how they <laughs> fought with the U.S., mm -hmm. and then the animosity that has existed between mm -hmm. the two countries. Uh, it was a super interesting story to put my hands so on. So you spent a lot of time in Mexico to... We spent a lot of time in Mexico, mm -hmm. yes. We went to the Anthropology uh, uh, Museum, mm -hmm. Uh, which is, by the way, one of the best museums I have seen in the world. The, yeah. the Museum of Anthropology in Mexico City is wonderful. And, 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 and we did all kinds of stories and then came to California to follow right. up on the, the U.S. side. Right. Uh, so I started doing a lot of... Dom also, I started getting involved in presidential campaigns. That's another animal, okay? Because when you're assigned, mm -hmm. you know, they have a pool crew. They can't have all crews for all the networks because it's too much. Right. So they select one crew from either one, either mm -hmm. network. Who's they? Uh, they made the bosses, you know, mm -hmm. let's say ABC, CBS. Right. Now it's CNN because CNN at this point was right. inexistent. Right. In those days in Central America, CNN wasn't even in existence no. until later. CNN came about when? I, I would say in the late eight, the right. mid-80s. Right. And when they started, uh, we felt sorry for them. They didn't have proper equipment. No, they were, yeah. you know, they were the new kids on the block. Yeah, new kids, and yeah. they were all very nice young kids, right. you know. And for us, we had incredible infrastructure with sure. our company, so we used to help them. The pool crew is selected when, let's say, the four networks, ABC, CBS, NBC, and CNN, get together, and they said, "Okay, we need mm -hmm. one crew to cover the president." Let's say the mm -hmm. the president elect, which in this case was Clinton, was president, mm -hmm. he was running for re-election. Right. And they select one crew out of, you know, they just pull it out of a container, okay, the name of the crew. Mm -hmm. And this crew will shoot for all the network. Right. So whatever they get, everybody else gets. Everybody gets, yeah. Right. So I was one of those crews. And mm -hmm. what it is, is you're inside what they call the bubble. 
the Secret Service is the bubble. You're right next to the president. You're inside this. You, you, you were. Yes. You yes, were in the camera. In that, you were yeah. in the bubble. In the bubble. Right next. To, you're right next to the president. Okay. And be, outside the bubble, there is several circles. They have several circles of protection. So you're in the inner sanctum. With, <laughs> you really have to have the credential wow. to be there. Yeah. And you roll that camera all the time. Right. Because if something ever happens to the president, you don't get it, boy. Oh, Nobody get... got it because you're the pool crew. Right. So you're constantly rolling. Yeah. And the, the uh, Secret Service are very nervous, okay, when you're... I mean, they know who you are, believe mm -hmm. me. They don't talk to you. They don't talk to anybody. Right. But they know who you are, and they kind of keep you inside the, the, the mm -hmm. bubble, mm -hmm. you know, kind of protect you, make sure that... And uh, you go from town to town in a matter of hours. You fly all over the place. Mm -hmm. You hear the same, the same speech. The only thing that changes is, I love this great town on Peoria. Or wherever you town. are. Yeah, right. wherever Hopefully you, you are. don't screw up the right, town. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you're inside there. So this know? is, uh, wait, so, so you were uh, following the, the Clinton campaign, the Bill yeah, Clinton I campaign. Clinton is this is his re-election bid? Or, or that was the re-election, right. yeah. And I also worked with uh, the campaign of Al Gore. I got to meet Al Gore. I got to meet the Clintons too. Mm -hmm. The president, uh, Madame Secretary of State, right. when she was Secretary of State. I met her daughter too. Mm -hmm. I met all of them. Right. Then I met, uh, uh, what was the vice president that run? Uh, Gore, Al Gore. Mm -hmm. I met Al Gore for ABC. We had a special done on Al Gore when he was running. And right. we went to Carthage, Tennessee, where he's from. Okay. And I met his wife. We had a, this was an incredible overkill. NBC had this production set up, okay. Mm -hmm. That uh, I remember uh, Mrs. Gore comes out because we were there early in the morning setting up. Mm -hmm. And she steps out of the, and I happen to be there when she comes out. She mm -hmm. goes, hi, good morning. She looks at the setup and she goes, Oh my God, is this a movie? Set? She yeah, goes, yeah. just for an interview of me and my husband. I said, yes, ma'am. You know, they had this, I mean, this incredible setup. It yeah. was overkill, but you know, sure. typical network overkill. And then uh, Al Gore came out, you know, and he apparently he, he, he was able to speak a little bit of Spanish because he said, do you mind if I practice my Spanish with you? Hmm. And I said, no, sir. So hmm. I talked to him mm -hmm. early on, you know, before they were supposed to be ready. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did that. So I got to meet a lot of the people in right. the government. I used to travel all over. I'm doing all kinds of stories here. Yeah. You know? Our boss will, he made sure that, that the assignments I got were the best, with the best people NBC could offer. And then, of course, with ABC and then re later with right. CBS. So what, yeah. Let's talk about, I want to talk to you a little bit about the pay. You know, like you, they're sending you out there to, you know, going back to your, you know, the, the assignments that we've talked about that you've had before, you know, in, in all these dangerous areas. It, it, you know, not that it really matters because if, if something happens to you, money doesn't mean right. anything, right? But do, is, is it at least worth your while, economically speaking? The pay was pretty good in the sense that being a freelance, we belong to two unions, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, NABIT and IBEW, to be able to work for all the network, we had to belong to those two unions. Right. So the unions had negotiated a contract with the networks where uh, working in the U.S. was very profitable for us if you go into overtime. Because mm -hmm. if you go after eight hours, mm -hmm. eight to 12 hours is considered overtime. If you continue after 12 hours, it's considered consider double time. And then they factor in if you miss a, a, a meal, it's called meal penalties. It keeps adding up because <laughs> mm -hmm. otherwise they keep you going. Right. They don't, won't break you if they need you, right. but it's costing them. Okay. Right. So on a given day on a local story like the Liam story, the Cuban kid, mm -hmm. I used to put, I used to make seven, eight hundred dollars a day. But overseas was different mm -hmm. because the union didn't have jurisdiction. So we freelancers negotiated directly with the network and depending what your stature was with mm -hmm. the network you were able to say okay i'll go to colombia but i want to make 650 a day right 
and they will buy it. They will right. pay it. Right. If you were worth it, they knew. You so know. It was, you, you based it on a day rate? Day, daily basis. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, they had to pay for the rental of my gear. Sure. Which at this point, I own over about $180,000 worth of gear. Just the camera alone was worth $45,000. This huge Ikagami, you know. Do you still have it? Oh, no, no. I sold all that. I still have a little camera that I use for my work. Yeah, yeah. It's a 4K little Sony. Oh, you went 4K now. Yeah. Well, good for yeah, you. Yeah. <laughs> right. No, you know what? Uh, I didn't want to... Actually, they offered me to do camera. They want... Because... That's the, the, the next step for a uh, sound guy mm -hmm. to become a cameraman. Right. I didn't want to be a cameraman because, first of all, the cameras were too big. I found it very cumbersome to carry that. Yeah. Most cameramen had back problems from right. carrying. Right. And then I inside the black and white viewfinder. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That wasn't what I wanted to see. You I, wanted to see everything else. I, I wanted to see everything and yeah. hear everything. I'm doing audio was perfect for me because right. I was able to jump in and get an interview Spanish or English, you know, whatever. Yeah. And and also alert the cameraman for something that he wasn't sure. able to see. Right. And I always had a good relationship with my cameraman. Right. Okay. Right. They they trusted my judgment implicitly. So I didn't want to do camera. I'll tell you when later on in my profession, when the cameras got smaller and digital, then I started grabbing camera. Right. And then it will be a situation where we're in a country where Okay, we need to get a lot of B-roll guys, you know. Yeah. But we only have one camera, and I will say, well, I have my camera here right. to the producer. You are, what do you need? Just oh, Louis, you can do camera. I go, of course, I can right. do camera. Right. So they go, this is great. Right. So we'll send the cam the regular cameraman somewhere, and you go somewhere yeah. else, you know. And so I was able to do a little bit of everything. Mm. So you never, you never actually worked as a full-time employee for any of the networks. You were always a freelancer. That's correct. But you always were busy because you were one of the top guys. Right. I was always right. busy. I will say, you know, in the whole United States, I will say maybe it's that three or 400 people that mm. are hardcore that you you run into them all over the world. Right. These are the top people, cameramen, soundmen, producers. And, and you we were, all knew each other. And you were in that You were I in that was group. part of that, yes. Right, right. Highly recommend. I would get a call mm -hmm. from uh, CVS, like when I went with Dan Rather. Yeah. I get a call from this top producer in, in New York. And the man goes, this is so-and-so. He goes, uh, you don't know me, but I know who you are. Mm -hmm. And we're putting together uh, three crews to go with Dan Rather to interview Fidel Castro. Are you right. interested? Of course right. I'm interested. Of course you are. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And that's how we will go, okay? yeah. yeah. And, uh, you know, then rather, for example, I had met him during the wars in Central America. He was constant mm -hmm. fixture down there. So it was Tom Brocco and Peter Jennings. Sure. And when I reminded him, I said, you know, I remember seeing you. He said, he said to me, I know who you are. I know your background. He right. goes, you have come highly recommended as the, being the Cuban guy to have. Never mind that I wasn't Cuban, but right. I made <laughs> my point of yeah. knowing the Cuban history. And I had excellent, I mean excellent connection with some of the top mm. Cuban officials. Yeah. People that, that became very friendly with me. Yeah. Number one, because I didn't criticize the revolution. Right. Although I had plenty that I didn't like, but right. I didn't go to the country. But I think that's what also makes someone valuable to a network, is someone who has all the different, not, not just the skills, but also the right attitude, right. the right tact knowing what to say, when, where, how, you know, like you're talking about getting access to something and getting creative about how can you, you know, not bribe the person, but help them out, you know, so that they trust you maybe and yes. open the doors for you, right? Yes. All that makes a good journalist, sound guy, cameraman, producer. And once you, when you have all that and you recognize for it, then they want to keep working with you right. because you become valuable. Right. Yes, and not only that, but you become very confident that you can, yeah. you're able to convince people yeah. by being nice. You know, I used to call gentle persuasion. Right. That you, you, you push, but you know when to back up. You know, you're very nice. You're always smiling. Yeah. Giving them compliments, you know, and trying yeah. to, like the Argentine guy, that mm -hmm. I, I got to him by saying, now you can show the world by taking us over there what right. you're doing. Right. It's and he skill. bought that. Yeah. He bought that. He really bought that. Right. Okay. I can see the attitude. He didn't say right away, yes, you're going, but I right. can see that we were getting to him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I used to use them in Cuba the same thing. I never mm -hmm. criticized them. Uh, I had the personal phone numbers mm -hmm. of some high ranking Cuban officials. Also, I was 
I wouldn't say 100% trusted because I don't think they trust anybody 100%. Right, right. But I was highly trusted because they knew I had been with Fidel. Mm-hmm. And that's a huge, okay, mm-hmm. plus. And they all also knew that I had been with Fidel with Maria Schreiber. Right. With, uh, you know, I was in Cuba with Tom Brocco and right. then with Dan Rade. So, yeah. boy, this guy is, you it's, know. Yeah, I mean, this is, yeah. He's up there. I mean, these people right. don't just hire anybody. No, no, absolutely And that not. gave me tremendous right. leverage with the Cubans. Okay? Right. Another thing is that most of the Cuban people that we dealt with were fluent in English. They all had trouble here. They were yeah. very knowledgeable of our country. Mm-hmm. And a lot of them were, were uh, love American music. So I used to get cassettes and just bring it to them, just, or books, you know, and bring it to them as a gift. So these people were really, really, and it came handy many mm-hmm. times. I can tell you a number of stories, okay, where I was competing with American producers. Yeah. But let's say we needed a special spot to go to take the correspondent and do a, a stand-up. Yeah. And I had to negotiate that with my Cuban counterparts. Mm-hmm. And they will go, oh, Molina, you're going to get us in trouble. But they will allow me <laughs> to do it. They'll still do it. <laughs> and the other ones couldn't get it. Right. Many right. instances that happened. Yeah, okay? yeah, yeah. And that only made me valuable in the eyes of my bosses. They sure. knew that right. with me being there, you know, not only I was able to get the story, right. but to relate to the people, which yeah. is very important. Oh, no, it's, yeah. Okay, very it's key. important. It's key. It's key. Literally yeah. the key yeah. to yeah, get yeah. in. No. When, did you, when, did, when did you go to the Middle East? Uh, it was 2003. I went to Iraq in 2003, November 2003 mm-hmm. until by June, July 2004. I mean, this the, the war started in '03. That's when right. we invaded. So you were right there. From I was the very- right there, like a, like two three months after we invaded. That's when they were hanging Americans from the from the bridges. They were hanging you know. Americans. Yeah, they had these civilians that they captured, and they hanged them and burned their bodies. It was awful. Okay, you, you saw that? No, mm-hmm. this happened right before I went to Iraq. But this was the situation in right. Iraq. You know, the hotel we were staying, we had British bodyguards you made by NBC. Yeah. yeah. NBC had these British bodyguards. Mm-hmm. They were handpicked because they were all paramedics and they all have served in the special forces. Mm-hmm. So they were really, I mean. Badass uh, people. Yeah, badass mm-hmm. people. Right. They were, and it was kind of conflicting because they're trying to protect us, like, don't go there. But our nature is to go where the problem is. Right, right. So it was, you know, but I got along with my bodyguards. I mean, I knew why they were getting paid. And and they were protecting the hotel from anybody coming in. Staying in that hotel in Baghdad was awful. Every other night there was a major fighting going on around us. It will start with machine gun fire, okay? Then you see the higher caliber, kapoom, kapoom. Then you see the helicopter gunships strafing. Then you, all hell breaking loose that you have to, you know, get dressed mm-hmm. and have a backup, backpack ready in mm-hmm. case you have to evacuate. Right. Because we have a contingency plan that if the bad guys overrun our security at the hotel and they try to harm us, mm-hmm. they were immediately, immediately to call the U.S. Army and they were going to send helicopters to take us from the rooftop of the hotel. <laughs> hotel. Evacuate. We had all the evacuation planning, you in know, place. in place. Okay, because every night, every other night, it was the same thing. What were you cover? I mean, what specifically were you covering in Iraq in in two thousand three? Everything. The situation on the ground, and then I hooked up with uh, Richard Engel. Right. Richard Engel was an incredible reporter, fluent in Arabic. He could read it, write it. He has spent a lot of time in, in, in uh, Egypt. That's mm-hmm. where he learned to speak Arabic. Right. And the people used to say to him, you speak uh, Arabic with the, with the Egyptian accent. Yeah. Because Egypt is the country that produces all their soap operas, uh, music videos. So they're familiar with the, with the, Iraqis, the accent. The Iraqis. The Iraqis yeah. are familiar right. with So the, the Egyptians would export their soap operas right, to, to Iraq. Yes. So they were familiar with the, yes, the, the, yes. the Arabic dialect yeah. they're speaking. Yeah. So uh, Richard spoke like that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, very early on, you know, in Iraq, Richard came to me and, and this British cameraman that I've been assigned to. And he said, look, guys, I plan to travel through all of Iraq. I mm-hmm. need a crew. You guys want to be my crew? And we both said, yeah, I wanted to see Iraq. Mm-hmm. Right. You have to understand that at this point in my career, I have seen it all. Right. But 
this was a major war. Sure. This was the Super Bowl, mm -hmm. Super Bowl of right. news coverage. <laughs> right. That right. as a journalist, you want to be part of it. Yeah. Not because you love wars, but yeah. because for your career, this is like the last thing. Wasn't that the first time? Well, I think the first one was the, Gulf, the first Gulf War where journalists were actually embedded within the military. And you know why I missed that war? Mm -hmm. I, I was supposed to go mm -hmm. with CBS, mm -hmm. but I was in Venezuela doing an investigative story about a, a Cuban-American guy who was stolen $100 million from Medicare and flew to oh. Venezuela to hide from the U.S. government. And I was following that guy. Wow. I was living in Caracas, Venezuela for about six months. Wow. And so I miss going to the, to to the, the, to the first Gulf War. Actually, I used to yeah. tell my, my colleagues to bother them. I was living the life of a, of a rich person in Caracas while you guys are in the... In, in the, the middle desert, of the war. getting getting shot at. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 I used to you. do all this. You know, after a while, I mean, there was a, 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 a correspondent, Brian Ross, that was an excellent investigative reporter, and he had connections with the intelligence, uh, law enforcement, the State Department. Right. Uh, he was super connected. Okay, he's the one that was following the story of the Miguel Recare. Yeah. And he, he knew my capability. I have worked with him all over. Right. So he called me. He said, Louis, this is uh, one of those 007 missions. <laughs> Are you interested? Right. He said, the guy we're following is a sharpshooter. <laughs> He's protected by Israeli bodyguards. And I can give you all the information if you're interested. It right. was like one of those Mission Impossible. Right. They give you an envelope right. with the picture of the guy you know, information of possible places where he was living in Caracas. And your mission is right. to go to Caracas and see if you can find this it's guy. It's like some 007, yeah. shit, you know. Yeah. And if you yeah. find him, find a way to get some video of him so right. we can prove that he's, he's living there. Because mm -hmm. the, the Venezuelan government was denying it. The mm -hmm. U.S. Embassy in Venezuela was denying it. Right. But we knew he was living there. there. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so I missed the first war. Right, that. because of that. That because story yeah. alone is another story that when I write it, because you have no idea yeah. what, what I went through. I yeah. found the guy, by yeah. the way. I found Oh, them. really? Yes, I found him. Oh, I wow. found him. But twists to the, to the story yeah. that, you know, I couldn't get the film of him because he disappeared. They discovered that he was... Ba about him and another Cuban American living in Caracas mm -hmm. were buying all the main stock of the biggest bank in Caracas with all the stolen money. Right. So the, all the rich people in Venezuela hire investigators. Who the hell is buying all the right. stock? And they discover it was this guy. So they, they publish his picture on the front, one of the biggest newspapers in Venezuela, right. after I, three weeks after I had arrived. Wow. So he went under. Right. But we were on the same track. Okay? Right, right. I wow. was living in the same building with this guy. I managed really? to rent an apartment. I'm telling you, this story alone is like 007, man. I enjoyed that. You were tracking the guy? You were after him, trying to get footage of him? Right. And, without, and, and the trick was for him not to know that you No, were he couldn't let him know. I was in, in jeopardy of being killed if he right. knew. Right. You know, I tracked him down. I found out right. where he was living. Wow. You're, uh, you're, you're, you're in the process of writing a book, right? Yes, I am. Yeah, you yeah. read my, my I read first, some of it. I saw, yeah. I, and, uh, you know, I was telling you this on the phone, too. Like, I was totally into it. And I think yeah. you definitely need to continue it because the stories that you told of the earthquake in Nicaragua that you went to cover and the way that you describe it, it it's almost like you could sense it. You could you feel like you're there, you know? And, well, that's um, what I try yeah, to do. And yeah. also, if you notice, I try to give you the, the, the historical background of what's going on, you know, because you need to understand uh, yeah. the background. It's like a painting. I mean, not like a picture. The background yeah. is very important 100%, to understand, yeah. you know. For sure. So when you, were in, when you were in Iraq in 2003, um, what, what was probably like the most significant event that happened to you, you know, that you were able to cover while you were out there? Uh... Well, there were several. When they had those IEDs going off and you had to go in the aftermath, oh, my God, it's horrible. Why? Because the rivers of blood, all these people injured, and mm -hmm. when you see our soldiers, white, they had no blood on their faces. They were so scared, mm -hmm. you know, and people screaming, don't move, don't go over there, because sometimes they used to put a bomb and then they put another bomb program to go off uh, like mm -hmm. 15 minutes after, calculating that the rescue people or the soldier right. will be there right. and our bodyguards with us, you know, be careful, don't go there. You know, I, I mean, the whole mm -hmm. things was, 
very oppressive, very, mm -hmm. uh, and you go back to the hotel and you're shaking. But the main thing that happened to me, I was exposed to an IED, an improvised explosive device, and that scared the hell out of me. What happened? Did, were you uh, in a vehicle when it exploded? No, we were, we were outside this high school that had been destroyed during the uh, invasion. Mm -hmm. But you know how we do in this country. We go to this, this we invade the country, we destroy it, mm -hmm. and then we rebuild them, right? right? So we had destroyed this high school when we invaded Iraq. Right. And now the Army Corps of Engineers and some construction companies attached to the U.S. Army had rebuilt the high school. Yeah. And they were giving them back to the Iranian, to the Iraqi government. Mm -hmm. So we were there to film this. It wasn't nothing warlike. Yeah. And uh, we were interviewing the Minister of, 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 uh, of uh, Education. Okay. The Iraqi Minister. The Iraqi right. Minister right. of Education. And he spoke English, you know, with sure. the British accent. Right. And so we're talking to him at the entrance of the, of the school. We had done filming. Beautiful. They mm -hmm. had done a good job. And a few, uh, uh, well, a few feet, about 100, 150 feet from us were some American soldiers milling mm -hmm. around. And the captain that commanded this unit a really beautiful woman, okay, mm -hmm. the architect. She was the one responsible for this. Yeah. She was the commanding officer. So okay. they're all milling around, you know, about, about 100 feet, 150 feet when we're interviewing this guy. Right. When all of a sudden, wow, this huge explosion, right. okay, right where the soldiers were. And, you know, I mean, the blast throws you. It threw us on the ground. And all this glass, you can feel it. How far away did, did the IED go off, would you say? I will say 200 feet. But the only reason I'm talking to you now is that whoever set up that bomb must have been in training because <laughs> they didn't set it up right. It went up this way instead of, okay. So the bomb went off. And then I couldn't see anything where the soldiers were, just a huge cloud of right. smoke. And I'm thinking, oh my God, all mm -hmm. those soldiers are gone. Right including that pretty woman that was the right. captain that we had just finished interviewing her. And, you know, we got up and kind of cleaned ourselves and we started going when one of my bodyguards grabbed me. Mm -hmm. He goes, let's go back. Let's go back to the vehicle. We got to go back. Mm -hmm. And I shook him off and me and the camera started running <laughs> in the direction where the, we couldn't see anything, just the cloud. And after things started to, we see some soldiers on the ground, but none mm -hmm. of them were injured. They had the blast apparently wasn't set up right. right. They were, you know, they looked pretty scared, Sh shook yeah, up, but yeah. nobody got injured, okay? No casualties. No only. casualties, but we were really mm -hmm. scared. So the bodyguards literally grabbed us and threw us in the vehicle <laughs> and drove us out of there. <laughs> and then, you know, we tried to figure out what happened, and they said, well, apparently it wasn't set up right. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you all, the yeah. soldiers and you guys would have been gone. You, you have almost like a similar mindset as first responders. You don't right. run away from the action. You right. run towards it. That's right? correct. Because that's your, that's, your, that's your purpose of being that's there. That's your purpose. To, that's why you're there. Yeah. You know. It's like when, when we cover hurricanes, which I cover so many of them. Mm -hmm. You know, while people are evacuating, you're going into town. Right. To right. cover the arrival of the hurricane. You, so. you, you ever lose media where you look back and like, man, I lost that audio or I, that, that, that video really... What happened to it, you know? You know what? I was very close to losing something or, or missing a feed, what they call missing the satellite feed. Yeah. That you don't make it on time and New York yeah. is counting on you. I was really close a couple times, okay? Right. But it ne never happened never, to me. Yeah. You know, I was very, I'll tell you one thing, that I was anal about keeping my equipment in good shape. Mm -hmm. And I was anal about the maintenance of my equipment. I was really, really? into the, the, the uh, technical end of it, as well as the story. Sure. Because my thinking was, if you want to be a good crew, not only have to understand the story, but you have to be technically proficient. Mm -hmm. That anything breaks or anything, you got to be able you to be fix able it. You got to be it, right? right. Fix it. And, right. And, and that's something that I think a lot of, you know, you have to find creative ways of making things work sometimes, especially you when you're in an environment that's not so controlled and dangerous, right? I used to carry a case that had... Uh, all kinds of tools mm -hmm. and cables, adapters, you know, that I could work on the field mm -hmm. and fix things. Right. Okay. 
You have no idea how many times I went to a feed point right. and they will go, okay, a bare wire. This right. is audio and this is video. Right. What? Yeah. Bare wire and I have to make it work from there? <laughs> so I went into my, my bag yeah. of tricks and right. started putting something together. You, gotta make it you work. know? Yeah. And the correspondent, the producer, wow, this guy. Right. He's an engineer, too. Right. right. You know. Yeah, and that probably puts your value even higher, right? That's why I didn't, never yeah. had any problem. Right. As a freelance, I'm telling you, people out of the blue will call me mm -hmm. and they say, you come highly recommended mm -hmm. by so -and -so, somebody right. of mine. Right. You know. So. So what, what about now, man? I mean, you're retired from all this stuff, right? Um, you're no longer going out there putting yourself in, in harm's way. Uh, you're working on different projects. I think giving back is something that's super important to you, and you're involved with some charitable organizations. Talk to me a little bit about that. Yes. Uh, after my experience in Iraq and Afghanistan, and all the, all the war mm -hmm. situations that I see in the U.S. forces in action, yeah. I always wanted to do something, give back. That, that I didn't find the vehicle, and I wanted to do something. Okay, and then one day I read in the newspaper, the Miami Herald, about this World War II veteran mm -hmm. that has survived being shot down by the Nazis mm -hmm. over occupied France, and he was thrown in a concentration camp, and he was going to be killed because he was Jewish. Mm -hmm. Okay, but somehow the uh, Russian Cossacks came and rescued him at the last minute. Okay. And I'm reading this story, and then what the man did after he came back, he was very successful in his business, but instead of retiring, he founded this organization called Vets Helping Heroes. Mm -hmm. And he was raising money to train service dogs to give to the uh, veterans that are coming back with post-traumatic stress syndrome or traumatic brain injury or any other kind of physical, mm -hmm. you know. And when I read this, I'm thinking, oh, my God, mm -hmm. what a, not only what a great story of this man, mm -hmm. but what he's doing is something that I would like to be part of it. So I contacted the organization. Uh, it's here in Boca Raton that they have it, the, the organization. Mm -hmm. And I told them that I was a filmmaker, mm -hmm. that I wanted to do a documentary to help their, their not only tell the story of the right. old man that I found fascinating, yeah. but also what they're doing for the veterans. Right. And they were kind of, well, what do you want? <laughs> like, meaning, do you want to get paid? I told mm -hmm. them right off the bat, I don't want any money. Right. I will finance the film. Right. I just need access. Okay? And they did. The old man called me and he said, fine, let's sit down. Let's see what you have. And when I met this man, his story in person was 100% better than what I had read in the newspaper. Really? As a filmmaker, I'm thinking, oh, Great. my God. And then I asked him, has anybody done right. any other film? He said, no. I'm yeah. thinking, I can believe it. This is right yeah. down my alley. I like dogs. Right. I wanted to do something for the veteran. Right. I love history, what this guy did. You know, I was perfect for me. And so he opened, you know, I needed right. to have access to the training facilities. Sure. And it took a little doing because mm -hmm. a lot of people promise you, yeah, you can come. And, but it didn't happen. So finally, the mm -hmm. old man made it happen and access to him a sit down interview and mm -hmm. gave me access to everything and and did this documentary that uh, mm -hmm. he was shown on PBS. Oh, wow. You know, several PBS so stations. So finished, you finished it. Yeah, I finished it. Okay. I finished the uh, director's uh, it, uh, copy was like an hour and 10 minutes. Then I had to cut it down to 56 minutes for mm -hmm. PBS. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to, the TV edit that they call it. But then I did a, a short 15 minute mm -hmm. out of the whole thing that shows the story of the man who did it mm -hmm. in World War II and three different uh, veterans right. that I traveled to the northern part of the United States, the Northeast, mm -hmm. people that had received dogs that were trained with our money, okay? And the difference, talking to their wives when they tell you right. what a dog can do. I was so impressed and right. so moved. Right. Okay, I figured this is it, I gotta do this. And, well, they saw the effect of a good documentary. Same thing I discovered when I did Nicaragua. Right, right, you know? right, right. An incredible, good documentary will move people. Yeah, okay? I learned that in film school. Mm -hmm. I learned it in film school that I happened to be one of the few film students that wanted to do documentaries. Right. Everybody else wanted to do, you know, everything else. Understandable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
that uh, you know with this documentary yeah. I prove again. That's awesome. And so uh, the founder Irwin Storbroff invited me to become a board member. Uh, let me tell you, I have a retired five-star general mm-hmm. among the board members. Mm-hmm. I have a lieutenant colonel mm-hmm. that fought in Vietnam and got shot down over North Vietnam mm-hmm. and spent over 2,000 days as a POW next to McCain. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have a multimillionaire that's retired. He built those, those ladders, Werner ladders that you see on Home Depot. Mm-hmm. I mean, the list of people. I'm in a company of giants, okay? And this is all this, this veteran dog veteran, program yes, that you, that yes. you did, did a documentary I on. did a documentary, wow. yeah. And ever since, I've done other films, promotional films for them, mm-hmm. uh, stories about veterans, you know. Right. It's, the best is to hear that the, 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 the veterans tell you their story with for their sure. own words, okay? Because you, then you really get yeah. it, you know. Absolutely. You don't have to write any. I don't have to write the script for this. They mm-hmm. can tell me their story. Is, yeah. And then the wives, what they go through, because mm-hmm. these people come back completely different. Physically, they're the same, but they're a different person. That's the wives thing, can tell yeah, you that. A lot of people don't look at it that way, right? They look at the, the veterans, thank you for your service. And yeah, absolutely, thank you for your service. But the spouses, right? Thank you for their service. Thank you for being there. And Because like you're saying, they may go and be deployed as one person, and then they come back completely different because of what they've seen and experienced. you know. But the family remains the same. Right. And now they have to... You know, they now, have now they have it's almost a, a different person in their And in they have their, to deal home, with that. And they have to deal with it. Yeah. And, and it's not easy. People don't understand that when they come to the VA, mm-hmm. I film a guy that had a duffel bag mm-hmm. full of medication. How can a person take too many medications? It doesn't do them any good. No. Okay, they can sleep at night. They snap. They sleep with a pistol. The, the wives are afraid to startle them because they might be shot. Right. You know, I can understand that. I was there. I saw it. You saw it, yeah. Okay? So I have dedicated my retirement years to help nonprofits, okay? And the satisfaction that I get yeah. is second to none. Oh, I can imagine, yeah. You know. Louis, man, thank you so much. I, I want to say thank you for your service because what you've done over the years is bringing all this information, all the news to the masses and educating us about what's happening in the world. It is very important and it makes a huge difference. So thank you so much for being on on Full Focus with me today. Thank you.